evening, everybody. Uh, we have just one hearing tonight, but before we get started, there is the public comments section of the evening. So if anybody is here from the public who has uh, comments that do not relate to what we're about to talk about tonight, just please raise your hand and you can step forward. No? Okay. So um, mm -hmm. I will open up this first hearing, then we have a, a brief comment. This first Hearing scheduled for 7 o'clock is for a preliminary subdivision by Energy Positive Homes, LLC, at the North Campus of the State Hospital, Ford Crossing, map 31C-017 in Northampton, as published January 29th and February 5th. Just a um, administrative note, uh, making the presentation is Berkshire Design, who, because of the work I do, I have worked with them in the past and I'm currently working with them now. If anybody uh, has an issue with that or thinks um, that will affect my judgment, please raise your hand and I can recuse myself. Carla, as well, uh, at Smith College has worked with Berkshire Design in the past as well. So I want to get that out there um, to see if anybody has an issue. If so, raise your hand. If not, we can start with Rick. Okay, we're good. Yep. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I wanted to just address kind of the larger mass development concept mm -hmm. um, here. Um, there's a misconception, I think, about what's required in our special permit um, for trails. Um, and so the most relevant, uh, most recent document is the Cost Subdivision Decision, mm -hmm. um, and that references the 2002 Master Plan. Um, as it may be amended from time to time by the planning board and the Citizens Advisory Commission. And it's been amended numerous times, most recently in 2012. Um, and there's also a note under there, which I've, I've highlighted, that the paths have to be ADA accessible. Um, so there's nothing in our permitting, either the special permit or the subdivision uh, approval, that requires a connection through Memorial Park um, and in fact, the connection to Memorial Park is infeasible because of the grade change at the back of the park. Um, if you were to require that Excuse kind of Excuse me, path, what is Memorial Park, please? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, right there. So this is Beach Tree Park, which exists, and then Memorial Park is going to go here. Um, and the planning uh, uh, board members made a note, that planning office made a note that they would like to see a connection from here to here. Um, and it's not possible, and I don't believe it's required by any of our mass development's permits. So I just wanted to put that out there up front. Okay. Could you uh, show this side where Memorial Park is as well? And so that's Beach Tree Park. Rick, maybe in your presentation you can point that out as well, the areas that we're talking about. That's Memorial okay. Park. Yeah, the back end, isn't it? So this is, okay. Yeah, yeah I this see is that. the property line. Mm -hmm. This is Memorial Park. This is uh, the last house on the Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's go. <coughs> Sorry. But, um, I'm Rick Klein with the Berkshire Design Group, uh, partner of the firm. And with me tonight is... Uh, Carter Scott from Transformations and Pam Kimball. Um, and tonight this is a presentation for the preliminary subdivision and submission for Village Hill um, for energy positive homes. Would you mind speaking up, please? Mm -hmm. Sure, no problem. Um, <coughs> the rendering that you have on the, on the screen in front of you is the uh, artist's conception of what the community will look like. Uh, and uh, I think it probably might be a good time at this point to have Carter Scott, Head of Transformation, talk about the community itself, because the community itself is actually quite different than your average subdivision. And so, Carter, would you like to say a couple of words? Sure. Okay. As you can see in the early rendering, uh, we oriented the homes to the south and added solar electric panels on the roofs. Uh, this development will likely be one of the most efficient developments in the country once built. Um, we're trying to generate as much energy as we can use on each building. Uh, one of these buildings to the left, a salt box, has a, um, 
as much as 26 kW on it. So it is a, a HERS or home energy rating system as low as minus 87. That would take over the prior record, which I believe we have at Devon's at a minus 37 uh, project we did uh, with Mass Development a couple of years ago. Um, we're also considering um, the Living Building Challenge with pedal certification. Uh, so we're pushing envelopes where possible. Uh, this is an early design with cottages. We've, we've been modifying it with co-housing on the right. Uh, the designs will have evolved a little bit over time. Uh, but I think we have a very, very nice, well thought out uh, uh, project and uh, glad to present <coughs> it tonight. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Yeah, I, I guess the other thing I'd like to do is just put emphasis back for people to, so that they realize that this is an energy positive community. These houses do not use any energy, they produce it. So that's the biggest difference. Um, existing conditions. Let me just go back for a second. I missed one. Uh, proposed project location, as you can see, it's up at the end of Olander Drive. Um, and in the area that's lightly shaded with the orange around it, um, which is the, the remaining parcels for housing at the, that end of Village Hill. And uh, this is, it shows site context and some of the existing roads that already exist and how it plays out with the other roads and houses that are there. The site itself, um, existing conditions, the dark gray trees that you see there are the important trees uh, that are uh, required to be remaining and so we highlighted all those trees. We've measured the drip lines on all those trees and the root systems on the trees um, as well. So we could design around them. Uh, there's the existing trail network, which was in Carolyn's memo, um, talking about, so we are paying attention to how the trail systems work <coughs> and how to get there from here. So this is the general site design plan. Um, the preliminary subdivision for the public road that we're seeking is on the left, the loop road. <clears throat> the, there's a spur road that goes off to the right that goes to the co-housing and uh, up to toward the top of the page about halfway down to the co-housing for some more units there. Those are private roads, but the public road that we're seeking preliminary subdivision uh, approval on is the one on the left with the, the loop. Um, there's 85 units total, 32 units of co-housing, 53 units of, of non-co-housing. Um, in the co-housing, the 32 units is split up into 10 duplexes and 12 single families. On the 53 units of other housing, there's four triplexes, nine duplexes, and 23 single family homes. Um, and uh, I guess before I even get going into the rest of the, the presentation, <coughs> the other thing that we're doing is that this subdivision is being designed to the new Northampton subdivision standards <coughs> for low impact development. <coughs> and we're actually trying to take it one step further uh, to be ultra low impact development. <clears throat> this is the existing trail network versus the proposed trail ne network, which can kind of go to some of the things that Beth was just talking about. Um, the existing trail network is the, <clears throat> I don't know how to call it, darker purple, if you will, and the brighter purple or the reddish purple is proposed. Um, and we are um, retaining the north, south, and east, west trail connections that um, the city has asked for. I can come back to these with questions and I'll just kind of go through and we can come back. <clears throat> Here's how the unit types lay out. Um, a single family, duplex, triplex, and co-housing are segregated in different parts of the site as you can see. Um, then we've also done a phasing plan, which is illustrated here. And this is how the lotting plan would work out. You can see the um, we're going to be seeking uh, approval for a public roadway on that loop. The roadway up to the upper right that says private road with shading on it is it will be a private road that both goes down to the co-housing, which will come back in for site plan review. Um, but that would be a private portion of the road, um, mostly because of the uh, way the subdivision regulations work and that particular road won't have a sidewalk on both sides. And so we've elected to keep it private. Grading and drainage. Um, I guess the first thing I would say about grading and drainage is that the site is under a stormwater permit already by the city of Northampton. And so um, things that we're not applying for a new stormwater permit um, is part of what we're doing. 
Um, that said, what I can say is that the, uh, the loop road to the left, you can see the arrows of drainage, which are bioswales heading down to the center, um, and then it heads down following the light brown lines that just came on to the detention basin. That's the storm drainage system that will pick up the bioswales and take them down to the existing detention bond. The way we've done the drainage calculations on the site, um, many of you will remember that there used <coughs> to be another detention basin required for housing up to the upper left on the site under where it says grading and drainage plan. Uh, with the low impact development that we're doing and the way that we're doing things, uh, drainage calculations show that we no longer need that and we can use the existing basin. Um, sanitary sewer. The loop road has gravity sanitary sewer. The um, co-housing units that all will have ejectors, individual injectors in each unit. They come up to a common force main and back out gravity the other way. As many of you know that the area with the co-housing is a lower elevation than the <coughs> higher part of the plateau. Uh, water system we're just showing is, is a system that goes throughout and it's looped on the loop road as well. And so we have an overall utilities plan. And one of the reasons we developed the overall utilities plan at this point is with the low impact development trying to locate the bioswales on either side of the road um, because typically you'd have a curb and a tree belt whereas now we need rainwater collection on either side of the road and trees and utilities. So that was one of the things that we were working out as to how to do it all. Going to street trees, these are the specimen trees that are required to remain that, and the, all the calipers and, and tree sizes are shown to scale, uh, all individually measured. Then there are other existing trees on the site that are also being retained. Um, obviously toward the top of the page there's also a woodland back there, we're not showing the whole thing, but those are significant other trees that are not specimen trees. And then in addition to that, um, there's street trees and, and our submission asks for, one of the waivers that we had asked for um, was for edible street trees. And um, it was our um, thought process that the people that are living there would have a, a co-op, if you will, to um, enter into the thoughts of permaculture on the site as well and would have a lot of edible trees on site, which we will still have, um, but at this point we're not asking that they're in the right-of-way of the road uh, in concert with uh, the planning board's decision recently and comments on that. Um, so what, uh, just to continue on, so you, the, to have the discussion, because that's part of the preliminary plans to have discussion, um, because of the solar nature of each house, we need shorter trees. And what we were trying to do originally is have edible street trees as shorter trees that would just dovetail with the, the ability to keep the roofs open to solar exposure. Um, however, the Northampton Street Tree Index does have trees for use under power lines. And so what we'll be doing is using those kinds of trees instead of the edible street trees. Uh, this is a, a road cross section, and this is where I'm going to say that we're also, this was done as part of the submission, um, and we've now, we're going to add a sidewalk on the other side, because the other um, thing, in, as you'll notice in Carolyn's memo, for the street type that we're asking for would require sidewalks on both sides. And so what, we're, what we are going to be doing, or the plan is, is to have a concrete sidewalk on one side, and on the right-hand side where now it just shows the bioswale and a tree, um, we propose to have a gravel um, sidewalk or, or TRG sidewalk in keeping with the LID option of the subdivision regulations. Um, also, there, I think Carolyn might have had an issue about having the, um, one of the utilities under the road, I can't remember which one it was, but we've already moved that under the road as well. In general, what we're trying to do is take all the comments that Carolyn had and the conversations that you've all had and incorporate everything. Um, the same goes through for road width where we had actually thought um, as a design firm that you could actually um, do more traffic calming than the original subdivision regulation revision had called for and go down to 18 feet as you approach the intersection. Um, we're, we're, we're deciding not to do that. We're going to keep exactly with the widths that are specified in the subdivision regulations, which is a change from the submission that you've gotten. So uh, long story short, we're, uh, all the, the waivers that we were originally asking for, we're no longer asking for. So at the crosswalks to that, that waiver? That's correct. You're no longer asking. That's correct. Um, going to housing types. 
um, single-family homes through here I'm trying to figure out a Carter maybe I'll let you do you want to come up here and I'll just or if you sure. want to speak and I'll just do the slides kind of thing sure so the home on the left is a, um, a salt box home where south is to the back uh, that has an 18.33 kW system and has a home energy rating system of a, a minus 21 uh, the plan in the center was our first zero energy home and won the $15,000 utility prize um, the one on the right is a uh, uh, Greek revival um, but basically we're trying to get a flat roof area facing south and then super insulating the homes here are the duplexes and this is a triplex um, so historic uh, front we also have an historic side um, here is the co-housing area, again, orienting the roofs towards the south and keeping up some historic uh, like colonial uh, kind of cape uh, vernacular. Um, just to keep people in the loop, the co-housing is still under design. This is where it is currently. However, it is still subject to change. As, as you, many of you know, co-housing involves a number of different owners, all of whom are involved in the design process. So it's progressing as we speak, and we will be coming in for site planning. <coughs> Current version of the common house building. And this is a two family in the co housing. This at the moment is a congregate uh, home in the co housing. This is a duplex uh, flat, so one bedroom and a two bedroom flat. This is that early rendering which we've evolved from, but uh, we made about a year ago, early concept sketch of the, of the whole project. One of the, the bigger differences that, that you would see in this rendering from where this was done to where we are today is you can see the large solar carports in the middle. Uh, we're no longer planning those. We have enough energy production on the homes that we don't need them. And this is a street rendering of um, just to give you a general character of the street and so on. So that's the presentation. Um, we can go back and talk about particulars as you like. Questions from the board? Could Al? You? Oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple questions. Uh, the so it's 85 units? Yes. It's all right. Confusing to me because um, the <laughs> Seems to show a hunt. If, if I um, general site plan, you show on both sides how many housing units, and it adds up to a hundred. Um, that may be at the time of the submission where we are today is 85 units with the breakdown that I was mentioning before. So. Should this be amended? Um, we can amend it if you like, although I think for the preliminary plan it's not may not be necessary because it's the preliminary plan. I mean, unless I'm misreading something, you, you call out 23 housing, you have how many housing well, units on both? I know, but let me just go back through it, and Carolyn, it is, it is for you as much as anybody else. For the 53 units of non-co-housing, there's four triplexes, nine duplexes, and 23 single family. And so that's how we arrive at the 53 units. And then there's 32 units of co-housing. So. so you reduced it from what it shows here. Correct. Um, so I could just speak to that a little bit. The, so there's no maximum or half on the number of housing units. And since this is preliminary subdivision, um, the number still may be in flux. But right. I, I mean, there's no, uh, I mean, when you see the final plans and the final site plan, understood what the numbers were um, so we wouldn't need any amendments of this because they're going to come back for a full definitive plus site plan right okay um, and are they for sale or rent or does have you decided uh, most likely for for sale there's a possibility of uh, some of the duplexes and triplexes. 
And can I clarify on the number of units? Uh, since last summer, since the land disposition agreement with Mass Development, um, we have been at 85 units. So if the plans say otherwise, it's just a labeling error. Um, and how they're depicted in terms of triplexes, duplexes, and singles add up to 85 units. Um, oh. Sorry. Okay. My, my last question, just curious. TRG sidewalks, how do you shovel them? Um, TRG can be plowed. Uh, many people have TRG driveways and they get plowed and what ends up happening with TRG is that every few years you'll have to go back and play with it and level it out and add a little bit more TRG. Um, but that's the requirement in the low impact development. So that's For, fine. So they percolate? Is that the idea? Um, if you were to talk to Doug McDonald at DPW, he would say that the infiltration rate on DPW is really not much, or on TRG is not much less than um, asphalt. Uh, however, it is more permeable than asphalt. So um, I guess the other thing I should probably point out is that the, the main loop road is being done as a residential yield street, so it can become a public way. And then the, you can see the little alleys that come through there. There's three of them. Mm -hmm. Those are done as private alleys in, in conformance with the subdivision regulations. And the private roads that are off to the right are done in conformance with the private road um, as well. Uh, question is, is the only thing we're talking about tonight basically is the loop road. So there, there were staff comments on the co-housing area. Are those up for discussion tonight, or is it just should we the focus just be on the loop? Well, the focus is on the loop, but I think the idea well, because so technically this is preliminary subdivision, mm -hmm. so it's just about the loop road. But they've given the plans, and so if there are, are comments or concerns, I mean, I <coughs> sent you the staff report with comments. Um, I don't think it hurts to get it on the table now. So as they're redesigning this stuff, there can be conversations back and forth about how to address those. So okay. um, yeah. I think it sh uh, my recommendation would be to talk about it all. Yeah. Um, but you know, specifically, you want to make sure you know any technical standards about the road also you know get addressed. And we're happy to about talk about it all as well. Okay. So you want to just go through each one of those? Um, so I think these are all in the um, well, maybe not all, but most of them are on the co-housing. Number one, driveways need to be offset from intersecting streets by at least 50 feet. There's some of those outside of the co-housing, um, actually down here on the at, right near the intersection of Ford, Ford and Olander Loop. There were a couple driveways that were closer than 50 feet. We'll look to address that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next up, uh, the PV carport in the co-housing area is blocking the emergency 12-foot wide drive. That's actually not on the plan anymore. The plans that you have on the screen tonight no longer. Okay. What we've done is we've done a major shift from the plan that you had submitted to these plans where we used to have the carports and collective parking in the middle. We no longer have that with the units that are there. Each unit has a sufficient number of parking spaces on its own. So the plans we have are the preliminary plans to the preliminary. That's correct. <laughs> Keep evolving as we speak. Oh, wait, can I clarify? So, but even on the screen, you're showing carports? Or are you saying in the co-housing, there'll still be carports? Uh, the co-housing is still up for grabs. Um, okay. But in the main part of the housing off to the left-hand side, where there used to be carports, there are no longer. Right. I think that okay. comment was related was specific to the co-housing section. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, I see. This is specific to the co-housing section. Yeah, the, the, the PV carport in the co-housing area is blocking the emergency 12-foot wide drive. Okay. From the southern part, right. and that will need to be revised. Yeah, we'll revise that. Okay. Uh, the through path behind the PV carport on the north side doesn't appear to be wide enough. The dimensions need to be clarified for this internal network connection. That, that, that might be in the, the one that's been discontinued now. Right. And the last one, the internal path that crosses the co-housing driveway should be clearly designed with material changes and elevation changes to force cars to stop slow down at the crossing. Um, the only thing that I would say about that is that the road that goes down from the loop down to co-housing is going to be a relatively steeper road. And I'm, um, we're studying the elevational change. We don't have an issue with um, having significant knowledge of drivers to, to figure out that there's a crosswalk there. We're trying to find the best way to do it. And it may or may not be the elevational change. And so if we can reserve judgment on that one. So, but you know it's an issue. Yes, so we know it's an issue. Can, can you go back to the, to the grading? Do we have a grading plan? And, and just yeah. walk us through the, the paths and sure. why they can or cannot be connected? Would you want to use the trail? We could use yeah. this one. Yeah. 
Oh, I just want to clarify too that there's not a, um, none of my comments to you all or um, um, Berkshire Design said that there had to be a path through the Memorial Park lot, which just to clarify is um, right here. Um, my biggest concern was sort of going back to the concept that you got that there's a north east, north south, and east west connection, and this has already been built up to this point. So somehow this needs to get over to here and come down the reason in a direct manner. Um, the reason we don't, we're not showing it as in a direct manner is it can't be done in an ADA compliant manner. It'll be all stairs the entire way uh, because of the slope right there is really quite steep. Um, I mean, it's flat at the, the over next to Olander, but it drops off in a hurry. And we're not able to actually get an ADA compliant pathway there. So our solution was to, to head up um, the continuation of Olander there, then across down the, the roadway, which has got the ADA waiver because it's adjacent to a roadway, and then come back the other trail. Do you, do you have a pointer? Can you walk us through? Uh, no. <coughs> Let me this one. Yeah. The, uh, right there is where we're talking about. And it's flatter right about through here, but from here down, it's quite steep. Um, and if I had to guess on the gradient right through there, it's probably between 15 and 20%. Um, well over ADA, and to try to figure out how to get ADA, the numbers of switchbacks that we looked at were significant, and uh, I don't think that's what people are really intending. Even if you went through a portion of the Memorial Park? Um, y yes, even if we went through a portion of the Memorial Park. What I can do is I'm happy to, to have some sketches and show you um, what we're up against. Um, but that's why we went to the plan that's on the screen. Does the grading, if you went, so we're trying to get from here over to here. Right. Can you, can you come down the park this way and then cut over, or does grading? Um, over by Jonathan's house. Yeah, that house for people that don't know Jonathan. Yeah. Um, it's even steeper. It is the harder part. And that's yeah. the, the memorial. That's where the fountain goes, right? That's mm -hmm. the, about. yeah. The fountain's actually going to go right about there. Yeah. So um, the other thing, we're actually having an issue with as, as long as we're talking about grades. You can see the contours that cut through here. That piece also is problematic for us trying to get that to work in an uh, ADA compliant manner. So we're still working on that also. So um, the, the north-south connection isn't an issue, it's just east-west. Well, there is a, I need my point. <laughs> there is, um, I mean, the other north piece, there's probably pieces that the applicant's going to be responsible for doing that might not make the whole connection, but, you know, there was, there's this piece that's been done to here, and this property is not part of there, so um, this north piece that goes up to the Mill River Trail mm -hmm. needs to be addressed, too. Um, uh, in that portion of the property. Um, our thought on that is that it's quite a nice existing trail as it is, and I'm not sure that anything we do to it's going to make it any different. Um, it's still going to be a, a gravel or stone dust path, and, um, and also it's not ADA compliant, so the minute we touch it, we have to start making things ADA compliant. So our thought was to just leave it alone because it's a well-used path and seems to be functioning quite well. Is, th is that the wider path? I mean, um, Yes. Well, it, it gets to be narrow. almost like a service, right? It gets narrower further up, which right. is mm -hmm. still on the property. But we're talking eight or eight point two percent, right? Not five percent. Um, well, or technically, the use path. Yeah, I think there's a different standard. Not there is, but we're not even going to make that. So, and as far as I know. The uh, transformations application uh, is for the paths that are shown on here only and not um, the, the revitalization of existing paths like the one along the river and so on. Clarification on the north-south connection you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's off this current site. It's to the left. Um, so it comes through the parcel that was going to be the Montessori school and it goes off to the left. Right, but then is, there's a since your property it's shown on the plan you submitted wraps over here. I think you know the connection would go up on the property there because along that there's that a historic path there. Um, that's this is still part of your property, correct? Let me see if I can go back to that. No, nope, that's not even on here. Um, you can see it uh, in this. Let me see. 
<coughs> the, the existing path is right here. Mm. Right yeah. Down through there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. Compared to yeah, and the, only <coughs> of the work we're proposing is here. But is that the property line, the orange? Um, that's a combination of the zoning line. Um, no, it's not the entire parcel line. Okay. But it's the the, the zone line is through there. Yeah. So um, the recommendation from staff to the board for consideration, and there there may be some issues about gray, but I think the conversation has to continue, and that the whole idea was connectivity to the outside world too, and so the north south connector it may stub out and not do anything for a long time but the idea was to create those connections to the edges well, i think maybe what we could do is if it ever stops snowing we can photograph some of that also prior to definitives coming in um so that you, you know as we sit here i can say you know here's station three or four and here's what it looks like and it's you know 11 and a half feet wide because it actually is quite wide in, in a number of places and so and just talk about that I walked all of that when we did the CPC fountain story, and I'll, it is steep because the big tree that you're keeping, you're looking, you're looking off the the fountain level into the, the center part. Oh, of this piece over here. Yeah. 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 But yeah. Um, I want. Have you? Did you discuss or switchbacks? Could you? Could you? Could you? The number. We we did a couple of quick sketches, and the numbers of switchbacks that are required is really significant. So that's why we kind of, at that point, stopped and said, let's try a different solution. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you, I don't think you have any uh, views, but how visible will this be as you go east? I mean, like, if you're on the, the soccer field at Smith, will you <coughs> look up, will, you, will it be, what is the elevation like? I know that it's, tree, that it's wooded now, but um, I don't know. Carolina. What that view yeah, will. <laughs> Coincidentally, I happen to be planning that section of athletic fields <laughs> right now, um, and right here is a significant stand of pines. Right. And so when you're down here, you really can't see much because these pines go up steeply enough that mm -hmm. a they cut off the the angle of incidence for the view, mm -hmm. but b they're also because they're layered like that going up, all you see is pines. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would you see it from, uh, I guess, all the way across over on the, at the end of Green Street, if you were standing there looking? Um, I don't think so. You might. No one has any plans to do anything with that pine stand, okay. and so I don't think they're going anywhere. And is there a chance you could maybe see something through tops of pines? Maybe, but I think that uh, that's as effective as an evergreen screen as anyone could ever plant. I think the question goes the other way is what can the houses see of the lights on the field I'm pretty sure that what you're doing there now is is night sky you know zero lot line correct why does it look like a, a gravel pit kind of I mean is did you just color it that way oh on this just, yeah yeah, we just we toned it down so it would be able to be differentiated from the rest of the park. That's, that's not that's not what it looks like, guys. No, although there's not really much topsoil there, so it, it doesn't really look like the rest of Smith's athletic fields, for instance. But it's not that color. This is just a graphic to help you identify location. Any other questions? So, um, your original 18 foot wide street can you tell me what changed your mind on that a little more about it um miss mish helped. <laughs> okay <laughs> well um carolyn do we have a turning radii on our street yeah because well, these let me elaborate <laughs> okay <laughs> so these are brand new subdivision regulations we really went from you know we've been ratcheting down mm -hmm. from big to smaller 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 and so for a public street you know we felt we had sort of worked in good faith with DPW to say we really want these narrowed at the intersection because that's where we want that's where the pedestrian crossing is going to happen um, and um, they they were okay with that so I feel like pushing it one step further getting rid of the raised um, crosswalks and, and then going narrower um, is sort of a step back and and for a public street if we're asking the city to accept it that means they have to plow it 
a little bit more room is probably better for snow, you know, as you're, uh, um, for snow plowing and just getting through there. Um, it is much narrower than what we have currently. So I guess the, um, I would be reticent to, um, you know, recommend going against the standards that you all just adopted that we worked pretty closely with DPW to, to um, finalize. Um, my reaction to it, I know these are preliminary designs, but you've got big wide turning radiuses and the whole idea of the street calming and, you know, what, and people walking and all of that was to try to slow down traffic. And so one of the things that it looks like to me there is um, if you don't throw it down, which is maybe what you were thinking about doing, but if you would think about sharpening the, the intersection angle so, as a way to slow down the traffic. And I don't know if I'm, I'm not remembering whether we put a turning radii in the... The standard is usually there or by default it's um, DOT, you know, right. or standards. Um, I think that we can... It's, on, it's only a comment. Well, if there's no... I think what will happen no is we'll, we'll look at it. Okay. Um, one of the things we'll come up against is the fire chief and turning radii that he needs for his trucks right. and things like that. Um, so, but we'll certainly look at that as an issue. Okay. And I will say, you know, I don't, I just at the beginning of the meeting, I sent the DPW comments. I don't know if you got them earlier in the afternoon from DPW. Oh, no. um, so we did get them okay. this afternoon. Um, Do you want to go through them? And um, I think we'll probably have to <laughs> because, you know, because I haven't even read all of them. Um, no. okay. um, but. You know, I think maybe we'll take board comments, and then as I'll, I'll try to get through some of them to s see which ones are really sort of critical in terms of redesign, and ones that maybe are details that can be worked out as you, you know, complete your engineering and design work. The other thing that we'll do is obviously we'll take the comments from DPW, go back and meet with DPW, and talk about them, and find out their concerns and where they need things amended, and, and do that. Uh, so that's part of what we would normally do anyway. Any other questions from the board? The, Alan? the applicant, uh, I assume it's a private um, real estate developer, business entity. Yes, I Energy Positive Homes is an LLC, uh, which I own personally. What's the timing on this? Pardon? First phase infrastructure, hopefully next summer. Um, once we complete the first phase infrastructure, probably starting in on the co-housing. After a certain number of units are sold, we'll start the uh, second phase on the left. And again, after more homes are sold, we'll start the last phase. Actually, to speak to phasing slightly, um, one of the, the you'll notice that there's alleys that cut through in between houses that serve garages and so on. Those alleys can also actually serve as a temporary emergency access uh, to close the loop, if you will, for the phasing. Mm -hmm. uh, a question came up regarding fruit trees. And I don't know if you've seen the comments from staff or earlier comments from planning board or DPW, but I, the consensus was pretty much, although well intended, it doesn't sound like it's a practical solution and that it should not be pursued. Despite the hungry homeowners that will result, <laughs> we will abide by that. <laughs> Can I add a comment to that, though? I mean, we were writing those for any, any. I know. We understand. And so I, if, if you thought, you, I mean, you could go back and see our concerns there were, you know, and I'm not changing our vote. We voted. But I'm just, right. in light of this project, I think that if you had a way, we were worried that they would become a problem. Right. right. And, and they easily can. We all kind of know that. But We actually understand completely how our the design plan for this particular community is adventurous, that yeah. not all others that come after it will be. And while this will have homeowners associations that are actually really interested in permaculture and edible trees and things like that, others may not. And so we fully understand your decision. And what we're, st we're still going to have um, permaculture and edible, edible trees. They just won't be in the right of way. This, this might be the thing, kind of thing where in the co-housing part, which is a private road, mm -hmm. have at it. But okay. on the public side, I think where that was it. Is there may be an opportunity to manage what we know is the problem, 
and right. I, I would think you know re as you recognize we were we were trying to be conservative for any kind of project this is an unusual approach to it if right. I mean I don't will they have but it's still going to be a public there's a portion that will still be a public right-of-way and I think from that perspective that's no different from any other subdivision mm -hmm. um, you know approval but they're also several private alleys and private driveways which I think mm -hmm. you know it's a different scenario also, I yeah. think that makes sense okay thank you that's it's well understood and we actually feel that we can still have um, the permaculture edible program that we want um, without having the trees necessarily in the right of way Anybody else before we open up to public comment? No? Okay. Thanks, sir. Okay. Is there anyone here from the public that would like to voice a comment? Okay. Yeah. If you, if you do, if you could uh, raise your hand, I'll call on you, come up to the podium and name an address, and then um, we'll hear what you have to say. <laughs> Where's the pointer? I'll show you my house. I guess the concern I have, and I'm we're here since last March, so yeah. I don't know. Does yeah, this we'll happen? Play. I don't want to touch um, can, can we uh, get your name, sir? Uh, Daryl McKenney, uh, 16 Ford Crossing, corner house down there in white, right across from the, the loop. Right there? Yep. No, the other side, the other end. Uh, I, I, the snow is obviously a little out of whack this year. The street cleaning's been reliable but with the other density of this and the number of cars coming in, I only hope that those taxes will go toward more equipment to better clean the streets. We're about a, a lane and a half on Ford Crossing right now. And I know that's in a lot of the city, though. <laughs> but, so that's, that goes into the concept here. I'm not, not against the houses, you know, but I think that's a major concern that uh, we have up there. I do. Okay, thank you. Yep. <laughs> Andrew Crystal, 51 Olander Drive. I have um, a memo from Jonathan and Meg Wright who weren't able to make the hearing and they asked me to read it into the record. <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to comment. I wish we could be on hand in person. We understand that the proposed loop road of Olander Extension is to be a public street and meet those standards for sidewalks, lighting, and infrastructure. Given the prevailing non-summer winds that place the currently built residences at Village Hill downwind of this new work, we would like the permits to specifically reflect intensive dust mitigation efforts, including wetting and chloride procedures for the public and private roads. In addition, all soil stockpiles should be covered and ballasted when not immediately used for cut and fill. During early road construction, some homes <coughs> were severely impacted, and the likely construction time frame for the current project may be five years or more. The area east of Olander Drive is currently home to many mature trees, and it is not clear from the plans that many of these survive, including some of the Copper Beach and other designated trees adjacent to Olander Drive. The tree inventory from Beals and Thomas should be reviewed in the context of this plan. The co-housing plan shows a shop and chicken house. Is this still true? I'll keep reading. We request that the shop be placed north and east in the complex away from the Memorial Park and other existing homes. The chicken house is at the south end of the co-housing complex. This places the odors upwind of the residences and also places it next to the open common land. For these reasons, we think it should be relocated to the north and east, away from the primary drainage swell, which it could pollute and preserve the open meadow views less disturbed. Throughout the development of Village Hill, strict adherence to the architectural guidelines prepared by CBT some years ago has been required. And we have been assured that these requirements will continue. Please find an appropriate way to mandate design conformance with the standards in the site plan permit. Thank you for your consideration. Um, that's from Jonathan and Meg Wright. I have a um, question slash concern I'd like to raise about the Loop Road. Um, when Village Hill was master planned, Village Hill Road was clearly designated as a primary artery. It's the only 
street of that width, and it's the only street that's got a yellow dividing line. The preliminary plan, as shown, um, puts probably two-thirds of the homes more accessible to Olander Drive. And it would be nice if the developer could find a way to lay this out that would encourage most of the traffic to go up Village Hill as it was always intended, take a right on Ford Crossing and enter the development. Uh, the concern is the way this is laid out, Olander, which is a side street, is going to become the primary thoroughfare for certainly all the co-housing people and half of the other homes on the development. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? No? Other questions from the board? Is there a chicken house? I missed that. <laughs> well, it's not part of the city. It's actually part of the co-housing. Is it on the it's on site plan? Bottom right, the, there's a workshop building oh, and a garden, garden area, area shed and chicken, chicken coop. coop. Yep. Chicken paw. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, related to that sort of location of those, um, some of the structures, some of the other structures in addition to that um, encroach on the sort of, um, I think, preliminary layout of the detention and drainage swale lot that I don't think has been formally created. But um, the detention area, which serves the entire most, um, more sites than just this site, and will be managed um, and under the care of the Homeowners Association, um, and therefore require access, um, needs to be on its own distinct lot. So that line needs to be carefully evaluated. So there's some structures along the eastern border there. It's that funky sort of, there's a long um, arm that goes north and then a square around the <coughs> pond and then there's this link coming down. So um, I think it's important that you all locate the structures outside of the area that's going to be maintained and then draw the line accordingly so that it's on its own lot because that is a part of the whole association, not just the co-housing site. One thing that this plan shows um, is the kind of the reconfiguration of that lot around the pond itself, the detention basin itself. Mm -hmm. um, you can see where we've shown it as this um, the rounded part in white is actually the detention basin. And what we would like to actually suggest to the city and, and talk to the city about is redoing that lot because the square is not, uh, I don't know, the rationale is way more space than is necessary for the detention basin. And uh, it's our hope to actually redefine that square, if you will, to be a little bit closer to the edge of the detention basin, far enough away to give access and things that are necessary. but. Uh, hopefully to reconfigure it slightly to allow the, the density of housing units. The Going to the south, um, that linear uh, pathway that you see is the existing um, um, easement or lot line, if you will. And same with the one going to the north down to the Mill River is the same. The only thing that we've um, taken liberty with, if you will, is the, the area directly around the detention pond itself. Do we have, what kind of regulations do we have about chickens? <laughs> Six. You know the chickens. Yeah, I know. Much. Well, smell is an issue. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I know, I know. <laughs> no, do we have a number? We wrote six mm. into the statute. Right. But so per my unit. Yeah, per yeah. unit. So that's my question here. When we were doing that, we weren't thinking about 50 units. I mean, that's that's a... Delaware chicken farm. <laughs> so. Well, but I mean, you did have a conversation about if you wanted to go in with your neighbors and sort of join forces so you could have. I more. had seven at the mm. time, Carol, and I had to have that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I think, but I think the location um, issue is a good good point. You know, if to the extent that you know there may be more than. Um, six chickens on the site. <laughs> there are more than um, there's more than one unit there. I think that um, 
I think it, it becomes a location issue. It may be relatively invisible if it's not, you know, I it's know. on the other side. And, and if the co-housing itself is downwind from it, I mean, there's an incentive to take care of, I mean, right. it can be managed, but I just, this this has me scratching my head. Um, well, I don't think it's our intent. If there's, even if you just take the co-housing into account, nobody else is interested, the co-housing is. Um, there's 32 co-housing units at six chickens per. I don't think it's anyone's intention to have 180 chickens. Right. <laughs> so, uh. Uh, before we close public comment, do you want to go over the DPW? Yeah, um, and I don't need to, I mean, I, it's a five-page memo, but a lot of it is sort of detailed stuff that really doesn't need to go into any kind of conditions, but it's about formatting and what's required for the final um, submission. Um, there was actually a concern, and we're talking about chickens, that the, um, a concern about the location of the coop next to that drainage swale or overlapping it um, shows less than 10 feet from the drainage channel. Will the chickens be contained within fencing to prevent impacts to the channel? And please indicate proposed garden area on this sheet. Um, so that was just relative to that. But I will. Um, um, the other issue I will say, DPW, in terms of the waivers, um, I think most, from what I heard, uh, most of the waiver requests have been dropped. Um, DPW did say they didn't necessarily object to eliminating the raised crosswalks, but they sort of left that open-ended. But they didn't say anything about, but they did object to the reduction of width from 20 to 18 feet. Um, and they objected to utilizing edible fruit and nut trees in the tree belt for the public way. Um, so I'm just going to skip some of this stuff. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Um, So a lot of details about the location of the infrastructure. Um, probably, uh, okay, so um, there's concern about no details about proposed sewer, um, a, about material type. Again, that's sort of more of a definitive subdivision um, requirement. Um, private force main and any associated force main services shall not encroach within the proposed right of way for Olander. Drive a manhole for the transition to gravity sewer shall be placed just outside of the right of way. Excuse me, downstream endpoints of each private force main. Um, this is all under utility plans um, and other recommendations about where to locate electric utilities and water shutoff valves. Um, They were concerned about the location, which I think was addressed in your um, layout of the street trees being in the center of the swale, center line of the swale. Um, so they're concerned about how the rain gardens and drainage swales will function if that's the case. Um, so just take a look at that, um, essentially the type of trees and where they're located in the swale. Um, And the whole coordination of how much flow is going into the existing detention pond um, when you come in for your drainage design and how that relates to the pond that was already designed, you know, how, what's the capacity. Um, and then, um, you know, that's all part of the stormwater analysis when you come in for your definitive. So actually, I thought there were a few more, but I think it was really mostly about the waivers and then a lot of details about things that should be included. I did forward those on to you. Um, um, this evening, so that should be pretty straightforward. So, ad that. administratively tonight, are we making uh, recommendations with conditions, or is just this just an informal review, almost like a technical review? It's more than a technical review. Um, it should be, um, you know, a, a up or down vote in terms of your voting on the concept, but things that you want to see or conditional approvals. Uh, so, I think the important things um, would be uh, uh, comments about the waivers. I think you've talked a little bit about, and I guess some of the, most of those are off the table anyway mm -hmm. at this point. Um, 
and then any other issues that came up in public comment and then also I think from our perspective you know the continuity of the trail network I think is something that really needs to be looked at in more detail and not necessarily uh, my recommendation would be not necessarily to approve the way the alignment is on the on the site but put that out there as you know you're conditionally approving the street layout but X, Y, and Z needs to be addressed during the definitive. So really but it is an official approval or denial. I mean, our recommendation is approval, of course. But So they're not really conditions. They're just points of interest that we will be looking for when it comes back through in a formal sense. Right. Essentially, you're not saying we're approving exactly as is, right. but conceptually, okay. it's the right direction. Okay. There, was, there were issues. There was a question raised about how the traffic was coming out on which street. Did the staff or the DPW or anybody have any concerns about this question of whether there was going to be too much traffic coming down Olander versus the other streets yeah. as was raised? There, was n there were no comments from DPW or concern about traffic volumes. I didn't see that in my quick view from DPW, it certainly wasn't an issue that at the Office of Planning and Sustainability level we were concerned about. Um, I think the idea that there is a loop road, I mean clearly there's a direct straight line shot from Olander. Um, I think the whole idea of slowing traffic at each of those intersecting points, you know, particularly if you have a raised crosswalk at those intersections, I think it may serve to sort of equalize the distribution of traffic because one way is not necessarily going to be faster than the other. Um, and there certainly isn't as much density as could be mm -hmm. developed mm -hmm. on that north side. Do you have a question? Um, I, I would just add that we didn't have the benefit of a, a, a diagram, a map, but we talked this just this week in the bicycle pedestrian subcommittee about um, what we all have assumed is going to be an east-west north-south connection there mm -hmm. so <coughs> just for the record it was yeah. discussed okay Ellen. I don't understand the parking or the access issues how, how many parking spaces per unit are there of the well, just referring to the co-housing. Doesn't look like there's much. I think it was either one point five or one point seven five. We were working with both numbers. Uh, it doesn't. I just quickly counted them. I may be off, but uh, I only counted about twenty-five parking places. Maybe I'm missing some. Uh, I think there are two things. I think there's a, a lot more than that, but also this, the co-housing area is still in design flux, and we will be coming in uh, for second review for that, and so that we will be sure to look at the parking to make sure that's adequate. There, there is. You do have the parking way up at the north end, but that's quite distant from the bulk of the housing. I, I would think. I mean, and the other. I guess the other sort of related question. I guess the 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 narrow they they appear to be walkways going directly to the to the housing units. Yes. So that's I mean that that's like a couple hundred feet away from the parking. Or in the case of the parking way up at the north end, it could be three or four hundred feet. Uh, which I guess that's okay if people want to walk that far, but it strikes me as a long ways. Um, it's been the subject of a number of discussions in the co-housing group. And as you may know, uh, co-housing is a group uh, consensus design process. And so anything that we come up with, all of the eventual owners there will all be in agreement with. Uh, and uh, you know, as a company that's designed a number of other co-housing units, uh, uh, communities even in Northampton, um, sometimes the parking is purposely away from the units uh, by decision of the group. Just for clarification, Rick, this is open parking yep. here, and this is covered parking? That's correct. Carports? That's correct. And at the top? There's, there's three actual, three carport sections there. So I think there's, yeah, which is, it's it's a, it may add up 
to uh, parking way up at the north. Mm -hmm. Is there a requirement to satisfy parking that it be within a certain distance of the housing? I mean, could it be across town? Um, well, in the plan, bill, uh, well, in most districts now, can be across town. I wouldn't classify that as across town. But in most districts, um, there's a parking requirement. In Plan Village, we eliminated the parking requirement requirements, but actually put a cap. So you couldn't have more than two spaces per unit. Um, so the idea is have the applicant come forward with what makes sense from a market perspective um, and what the <coughs> needs are. Um, but no more than two per unit. If I could explain the parking, the, uh, the current thinking behind the parking, if you will, and why it's arranged the way it is. If you'll notice, some of the houses are very close to the parking. And there's a number of, of future residents of the co-housing community that want to be very close to the parking for various reasons. And then there are others in the, the co-housing community that do not want to be close to the parking. They want to have a, a greener surrounding, if you will, um, and not necessarily be near the cars, and they don't feel that they will want or need to be near the cars. And so those are some of the people that will be living in the units that are further away. So in the parking layout that we do have, we've actually accommodated both groups within the co-housing group itself. Helen, what is the requirement per unit? There is no minimum. There's a maximum. Oh, the, that's so there's no minimum. Right. You say, Carl? It just it appears a very intentional uh, parking design uh, to keep vehicles kind of out of the center of the place. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm excited to see our new rules put into effect. I'm glad you're doing them. I, um, I think it'll be great to see what this actually, you know, we think we envision what's gonna happen, and yet I, I'm curious to your experience in trying to make it happen, what you think about um, the constraints we put on the, or sometimes lack of on the, on the <coughs> I mean, these are, I think these are some of the most progressive subdivision mm -hmm. uh, rules in the state. And so I'm really curious to see how it, it happens. Um, in, uh, if I could just respond to that briefly. In general, I think for <coughs> the average subdivision that might come before you, I think it's <coughs> and it's great. <coughs> I think for a client like Transformations that really wants to push the green envelope, I think it could be more so. And I'm wondering whether in the future, um, as the next iteration of subdivision regulations rolls out, that some of the things might get tightened down, uh, spe specifically at intersections and things like that. <clears throat> so, but uh, you know, uh, I agree with you. It's a huge step in the right direction. So, um, we're all for it. Which is why we backed off the waivers as quickly as we did. Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments or questions by the board? <coughs> Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, if I could suggest the planning board perhaps request uh, the developer to do a, a trip distribution within Village Hill so that um, the staff who didn't look at this issue would have some relevant information to make decisions because if it turns out that, that the traffic is not directed the way it's intended in the master plan, the mitigation might have significant impact on their subdivision layout. It seems like staff should review that before they go too much further with their design. Okay, thank you. Rick. Um, at the risk of ruining a friendship, um, what we are doing is following the 2011 master plan that was approved. Um, if you look back at that plan and this one, um, that plan then governed that the intersections on Mosier Street, and all, we're, all we're doing is kind of mimicking the road layout that was there. That plan comes up when it's needed and goes away when it's <laughs> not. That's my feeling about it. <laughs> okay. That's fair, too. <laughs> okay. Public comment still open. Anybody want to make a motion? Yep. Oh, hold on. Yeah. My name is Jan Ruby Crystal, and I live at 51 Orlin Orlando Drive. And I'm listening to this wonderful plan for the interior. Um, all these great things that are going to be done. But I'm concerned about the impact on the existing homes and families who live and have, you know, made this 
Village Hill their home, spending a huge amount of money to come and live there. And now suddenly, things are really changing that were not in the original plan that we signed off on. And one of those has already been brought up, but I'm going to bring it up again because I don't really know if you heard. The Village Hill Road was the designated road that you enter into the development. The other roads are offshoots off of that road. It should be the road that we enter into this new um, development as well. And to suddenly take a road like Orlando, Orlando Drive that has a curve in it, that has cutouts for parking, I'm not sure that that road is set up to be used in a new way. And I think it's very important that that's studied before you approve a plan that could affect other people who are already living there who have already invested in their life savings in this location. So I've said my piece. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. To, to illustrate Jan's point, um, Village Hill Road on this plan is right here. And this is the parcel that is still owned by Mass Development. And the road system would come up through here on a parcel that my client actually doesn't own at this point. So we're not necessarily against the conversation. At the same time, my client's hands are tied because we only have two places to, to tie into. In, this is a question from Master Ball, in the master plan, what is the plan for that chunk of real estate? Well, it was in flux. I mean, it was co-housing at one point. Um, and, and the school was going to go there, wasn't it? Well, that wasn't part of the master plan, but, right. you know, it's, it was sort of an area of unknown and potentially other housing. Um, I think one of the issues was there wasn't a whole lot of evaluation of topography there, and so once you look at that, it's, it, it became pretty clear that it wouldn't make sense to bring a road all the way around there because you only really get developed, you can only develop essentially one side of the infrastructure because the topo is, um, drops off on the other side. Um, at the same time, where this isn't the, the village, um, state, the village at State Hospital wasn't envisioned as sort of the 50s, 60s, and 70s concept of having collector streets with, um, you know, um, the, a main um, corridor, if you will, and you have these feeder streets coming into it. This was meant, this was intended to be a fully networked, um, you know, grid of streets. So the idea that you would just have one main road, um, as the collector road and have local streets feed into it wasn't necessarily the vision anyway when it was adopted. Mm -hmm. It does happen that because of the topography, it pushes more of that street network on the other, on, you know, to the northeast a little bit more than maybe was originally um, thought. Okay. And I think the other piece of it is having all the curves and the parking will act to um, not at, well will tend not to um, be seen as a cut through um, and people will just sort of find their way as they as they feel works the best so we would want the road intersections to line up I mean that's how you build a network grid but was there any conversation about not lining it up there I mean I can't imagine that there would have been but it, I just it's a good on Orlando yeah, yeah. In, in, in every master plan, 2008, 2011, 2012, there's always been this concept of a new road that lines up. Um, and as Carolyn mentioned, you, you can't move that loop over because there's a steep drop off on the parcel that is yet to be sold. So, and we did have our engineers look at it, and it doesn't work because there's a very steep drop off. Okay. Anybody else? Motion about public comment. Close public comment. Yeah. Second, John. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay, public comment is now closed. Uh, discussion. I mean, I, I think I haven't heard anybody say anything really negative about the plan as a whole. It's all just been kind of tweak, tweak.
week in comments, the, the main waivers, the only things we had to talk about, they were taken off the board before the presentation mm -hmm. even started. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some of the, the points brought up in public comment were valid and about the, the locations of the chicken coop and the, and the shop and so forth. Uh, the connectivity of the paths, I think, needs to be reviewed further and demonstrated that you know, why or why not, why they can't do it um, in the manner that the, the, the board was looking for. Um, the request for dust control was to, during construction. Right. I assume so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because it could be, right, right. And, and mm -hmm. I think the comment was it could be, a, this could go on for five years, and so mm -hmm. they just don't want to have a giant finish phase one and f end with a giant mound of earth that for two years is just blowing, you know, dust everywhere. S this, this is a curiosity question. So we, we vote on this tonight, and then what happened? Take me forward. So site plan for co-housing. Uh, well, subdivision first, because the way to get to the co-housing would be along the new infrastructure. So they'd also have to develop the definitive subdivision and get that approved either simultaneously with the site plan for the other pieces and then um, as they no noted there would be a phase build out so you'd be approving the site plan essentially at, in phases the way they come to you um, probably a definitive subdivision I assume they'll be coming all at the same time definitive subdivision and site plan approval um, and then um, road infrastructure would be under construction um, first in order to access that you have the water and sewer connections and those kinds of things have to be put in place before you can start building out the co-housing so and then the other units however the phasing works out so yes there would you know could be will be a multi-year I guess what I'm trying to get in my head is how different can the next version be and still be okay in other words, I, I haven't been through one of the, these preliminaries right. before. Well, in terms of you're not really voting on the co-housing, so that could change sub significantly because this is not a site plan in front of you. It's sort of there to show you context more and obviously to get good, valuable feedback when they do final design. Um, so really what you're saying, what you're voting on tonight is preliminary subdivision approval. So it's the layout of the street. So if, for instance, you think the loop road doesn't work, you want a dead end street, then you would vote no on this, come back and show us a hammerhead intersection or something. So what you're voting on though is, so short of that, you'd be um, approving the loop in its general alignment, but obviously subject to looking at the final engineered plans to make sure they comply every step of the way with the subdivision regulations. So this is sort of uh, agreeing to the structure of the place. Exactly. Right. And what I'm after is how dense could it get and st I mean it could go all the, uh, to minimum lot size and yeah. still be fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, there could be more units and you're not you're not approving the number of units now. Um, um, but it's all there for context. Okay. So co-housing um, is the co-housing going to have lots? No, it's going to be on a common That's where I'm parcel. So why, uh, I'm confused by your saying we're, the co-housing isn't before us. Their, their cover letter that says their planning board, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is a proposal for 85 units, which includes co-housing. Right. And it's shown on the plan. I'm, what I'm suggesting is you're not, you're, uh, your vote tonight <coughs> is not voting about the layout and the details of the co-housing. Um, your, your approval is based on preliminary subdivision, which is the infrastructure itself. So it's just the loop road. But what they've shown you is why they need the loop road in this alignment and how it's going to connect to the pieces that they're envisioning um, that are gonna be developed. So that's just there for context to say this is why we're putting the loop road here this is why we're having a private road coming over here because it's going to service all these units and um, this is why we want it to be a public street because it's going to have this many units um, so but the because it's a preliminary subdivision your vote is really just about the subdivision road it should be noted this is this is the only road up at village hill 
that's being constructed by the applicant. Every other road up there was by mass right. development beforehand. Right. And so when it came in front of the planning board, the road and the, the structure was there, utilities were all there, and then lots were being sold off and built upon. Here, the, the applicant has to build the, the road and everything that comes with it. So theoretically, do I hear you saying we could approve and, and the preliminary and the, then the final um, for the private housing and the, the loop road, and then when they come in for the co-housing, we could say, no, that's too many units for this road. I mean, is that correct? Mm. Doc? Um, well, yes, I mean, I suppose in theory you could say this road isn't going to support this, many, this number of units, although, um, I don't think that would ever happen with the number of units they're proposing. It, so. We recognize that we ran the risk. I know I can't. Yeah. Of understand. giving you too much information. Yeah. But we'd rather have you see everything and be able to comment on it than just only show you all the pros. So I okay. think the point is there. It's pr private roads on that side of of the development. Right, and you'll see. So when they come in for subdivision, definitive subdivision. They're also going to come in for site plan, I think. Simultaneously. <laughs> Simultaneously. So at that time, you'll be taking two votes, essentially. You'll be voting on the subdivision, and you'll be voting on the site plan showing the layout of all the other stuff that's not part of the road. The house locations, the driveways, the private roads, the co-housing, where the chicken coop goes, where the, um, you know, where the trails are, and, and all the landscaping and the lighting for everything that's outside of the road network. But still, the context, as you say, is is that there's 85 units being proposed, all serviced by this road that we're going to approve or not approve. Right. Yes, in regards to the public comment about uh, dust control, you know, when they come for us with the site plan, I mean, it doesn't seem like construction activity would be under our purview as far as a condition. Um, yeah, I mean, it does come up occasionally, and you could, I mean, there are requirements, but I think it probably makes, it can't hurt to have a condition, and maybe it's probably better um, for the final plans as opposed to, to the preliminary, but it can't hurt to put it in there that they should show, they should come up with a plan and pitch a plan for dust control, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, it is a long-term build-out. And so it's not maybe normally something that you would look at. I mean, in, in um, it's come up occasionally on other projects, but only individual sites, you know, that might be, you know, big commercial building that might abut a neighborhood or something like that. So that wouldn't be addressed in any other kind of permitting activity? EPA and OSHA and... Yeah. Well, actually, I think it is. Can I, can I just yeah. address that because no. of this? Yeah. And it's, you know, again, I know that. Yeah, this is I just think it is, and it could be um, in addition to that, but it also is a net, another measure saying, look, we know you're doing this build out, and there may be some of these other rules, but also some of those other rules may be harder to enforce because it requires an outside entity. Um, but, and I guess I would just say it's not, it's a quality of life issue. You're doing construction you know, in mm -hmm. this development. So I don't, I, I don't think it's, I, what I imagine is the applicants are gonna come forward and say, here's how we're gonna manage our construction. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna look at it and you're saying, great. And then that's part of the plan. So maybe there won't even need to be a condition. Thank you. Okay. So we're making a preliminary recommendation on whether- You're approving a preliminary subdivision. Preliminary, okay based on the plans in front of you and if you want to apply any conditions like um, I mean I, I'm hearing that none of the waivers are on the table so I don't think you need to ask um, or make a comment about mm -hmm. those except for the one about not providing an open space you know cluster plan or flag lot plan um, so you might want to act on that saying you know you grant the waiver for not showing that kind of plan and as far as the bicycle trail connection and I think you should make a condition that, you know, you're not approving the trail network as shown conceptually on the plan. You want to see substantial consistency with the, 
east-west connectors and the north-south connectors. So those are two conditions. One and third was what we just discussed about a, a, a construction plan to mitigate dust mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. And then we had comments by the DPW. It's not really a condition, but it's um, to make them aware or right that they that they should um, address DPW comments. Mm -hmm. And then we had some comments on the on the co-housing. Again, this is on the loop road, but since we had some comments on the co-housing that we want them to be aware of, do we do we bundle those together as conditions this time through, or? Um, yeah, since they're not. I mean, the only thing that I would say as relative to co-housing would be that the structures on the um, shown in the detention pond layout. Um, boundaries should be addressed. I think right now they heard the comment because the chicken coop is not part of the, uh, I mean, except to the extent that it's in that it might affect the drainage. I think mm -hmm. you could say make a comment relative to that. Otherwise, that would be a site plan review issue. And we had a a couple times. about the right now, the current layout of the carport in effect, uh, interfering with the emergency 12 foot. Um, path right um, we can throw that in there too and then it's a co-housing right so I'm not yeah. sure okay is anybody clear enough on that? yep I <clears throat> I don't know how I feel about it I I'm troubled by the concern expressed by the neighbors about the impact of a huge additional amount of traffic uh, on the on the other hand I guess anyone who bought in the earlier phase knew there was a lot of vacant land that was going to be developed. I, I, I guess that's what they bought into. But I, I don't, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking out loud or expressing out loud. I don't, I, I don't know whether there's any alternate layout of the loop road that would mitigate the impact of the traffic somewhat. Maybe not because 100 cars are 100 cars. I, but it certainly is going to have a very substantial impact on the people who live south of this development. I agree, and but it seems like even though the the current elevations, I don't think allow the village road to be to be a straight shot for that for the loop, right. because you you'd lose the left side of village road because it it drops off so much. But even if that were a straight connection. I think on the Olander Drive side, that would also, no matter what, always be a straight connection. So you might have more space in between, but you would always. I don't. I don't think it would ever make sense to, to have Olander and and this parcel to be offset. Um, so people going up to that side of of the new development and the co-housing are always going to end up coming up Olander. I would think. Yeah. You may be right. I, I, I have no idea, actually. I mean, I'm just wondering whether somebody could come up with an alternate plan that might arrive at a different result. I, and I, again, I, I, everybody who bought in the earlier phase knew something, knew they were looking at more traffic in the future. Um, I, I don't know. I'm just, I think it's a troubling issue. other comments is anyone yeah. no, um, no I just wanted to um, make sure I got the comment about drainage basin, so. Mm -hmm. okay, so you said anybody want to give a motion a shot Oh, and then I should just say, so all the, um, the, um, so this is subdivision approval. It takes a, a majority of the members, mm -hmm. so it's not like a special permit, it's four. And, um, the, and, and for subdivisions and subdivision regulations, associate members' votes are not taken, so it's just the full members. Um, that vote on a subdivision. Can I ask, did we end up with a DPW condition? The DPW comments um, in the just memo should be addressed. Okay. Can you tell me what 
tell us who our associate and our full members are. I've got one position uh, short. Dan and so Alan. So, Dan and Alan. That's why we were forced to sit over here. All right, Devin, you want to give it a shot? All right. I move we approve preliminary subdivision, energy, positive homes, LLC, North Campus State Hospital, Ford Crossing Map, 31C. 017. 017, <laughs> Northampton, with the following conditions. Uh, that there be a construction plan that considers dust over the long term of the work, that co housing structures adjacent to the drainage swale be addressed, that there is trail connectivity, that the DPW concerns are addressed. Seems like there's one more. Trail connectivity north, south, and east. East, west, north, south, east. West. Um, uh, you got the buildings and the chicken coop. Yep, um, in relation then, to the drains. Right. And then um, I think that was it. There were. There's one more, Mark. There were other. Uh, the driveways need to be offset from intersecting oh, sorry, streets yes. by 50 feet. Yes. That was actually in the loop. Yep. And then the co housing, just a heads up on the co housing about the emergency 12 foot drive and the carport that they can't, one can't interfere with the other. I think that's it. Second. So that's a motion. Carla got in there first. Second, Carla. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Don't need that. We still need that. Done. Yeah, the zoning ordinance oh, amendment. No, we Put that up on the screen, or do you <laughs> Where'd you go?
<coughs> While you're setting up, can I yeah. ask a question? Um, I was just curious how the uh, required space counts are calculated. Um, how how we came with to the numbers, or mm -hmm. how do you calculate them? How how you came to the numbers? I mean, is there a national kind of standard out there? Or? Space well, parking space. What are we? Yeah, yeah. bicycle parking yeah. space. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So let me pull that up. Uh, there we go. Do you think she worked all that up on her own? Um. It was a really cold and snowy day. <laughs> um, no, so let me just zoom down a little bit so we can get this all on one page. Oops, too much. Oh, good. So, um, good question. So, what happened? So, this is the. Um, oh, do you want to officially open it up? <laughs> oh, sorry. We are. Opening up a schedule for 7:40, so we're just about an hour behind. Zoning ordinance amendment 350-2, uh, 350-8.11, and 350-11.6 to define and specify bicycle parking and pedestrian access standards. Um, so we actually had a little bit of technical assistance from. Um, uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. We asked them to do research for us because we felt like, from the uh, certainly from your perspective, the board's perspective, not sort of going into every site plan and saying, "Well, we think you should add 10 more bike storage spaces to your hotel." And the applicants saying, "What? Where did you come up with that number?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we figured it was time to really sort of ha hammer it out and put a set of standards in the zoning. So we asked um, PVPC to help us do some research, mm -hmm. and there isn't a baseline standard out mm -hmm. there. So um, they looked at what other um, communities have done, and there's definitely not, you know, a consistent um, um, standard across the board, across the country. So to some degree yes it's a made-up number just sort of thinking about uses and spaces and maybe um, number of um, bike parking spaces that make sense and we but we also didn't want to make one standard for every single use so we were trying to figure out how to way to group uses that mm -hmm. would make sense so um, it really was a combination of looking at what other communities have done and then sort of thinking about um, what might work in Northampton and what um, comparable uses make sense to put together. So um, that's and so the bulk of the text came from um, you know initially Pioneer Valley Planning Commission pulled together the text for us and then we started playing with the numbers and um, editing it and and then moving it forward in the process. Um, so this what this does is it defines um, bicycle parking. Um, and sort of delineates, um, differentiates between um, the type of storage, so short term and um, long term, which is overnight for more residential uses, or if there's a you know a 24-hour kind of use, um, and then also defines what bike racks are and what the standard is for those bike racks. Um, and where we want those spaces. So the definition is the first part of it. And um, you know, an area within one, um, in, within which one intact bicycle may be conveniently and securely stored and removed without requiring the movement of other parked bicycles, vehicles, or other objects to access the space. And spaces are short-term, designed to serve trips of up to a few hours, and shall include bike racks that are a fixed in place stand which allows a bicycle to lean against <laughs> um, it in either an upright position with both wheels at a level surface. I mean, all of this was detailed because of problems we've seen with people, you know, just putting in ad hoc bike racks and what doesn't work and what does work. So we wanted to clearly define that. Um, and um, then a long-term space is designed to serve residents and others who require storage of bicycle overnight, which is designed to securely enclose and protect bicycles from weather. 
um, being located in a building, garage, or shed, or covered bicycle cage, or by locker. So that's the definitions. And then um, I think the change that came, so the highlighted um, cross out there is the change that came from parking and transportation. So there are a couple in here. This already went to parking and transportation. It hasn't yet gone to ordinance committee. It was supposed to go this past Monday, but the snowstorm um, changed that, which is kind of good because they like to be the last stop before it goes back to right. council. So this is actually going to go to ordinance committee next Wednesday. Um, and um, so I don't know if you have any comments about the definition or if you want me to go through the whole thing and then come back and review each section. You want to go through the whole thing? Okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. So then, so then the next piece is when do we require bicycle parking? So it is kind of a biggie. Um, section A: Bicycle parking shall be provided for any new building, addition, or enlargement of existing building, or except for in central business district for any change in the use of a building. So. Um, you know, every time we look at a building permit, this is now going to trigger the requirement for adding um, bicycle storage. So it's not a site plan condition, it's, it's change of use. Um, and we ex exempted central business because of the realities of, you know, businesses change quite frequently and um, there's not always space for storage in central business. Mm -hmm. um, so it would seem that central business would be one of the highest use areas of bicycles right and at the same time there's a lot of public provision of parking and more we hope will be forthcoming but so what it does is if you're doing a building addition or if you're in site plan then you would need to add it but if you're just transitioning from an office use to a restaurant um, the idea is not to require bike storage for just modification of a inside a building as opposed to an expansion of the building. Um, and then B, the number of bicycle parking spaces shall be calculated using the following table. What I've added since you got this was, um, and I'll go through this in a, in a minute, um, was that if you are required, then you need to at least provide one because some of these, if you look down, they're fractions of mm -hmm. yeah. spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and the first one Unicycle. is residential. <laughs> <laughs> and what that would mean is if you know, you're building four new units, you're at four tenths of a spot, mm -hmm. and that's not one, so you don't have to provide any. And I would mm -hmm. think that with you know, a place like four units, you'd want there to be some accommodation. It could be inside a garage or what have you, but um, that's what I added just today, so that would have to be, you know, voted on as an addition or an amendment going through the process if you felt that was appropriate. Yeah. Um, so for residential, hotel, motel, oops, bed and breakfast, one tenth of a space per dwelling unit or hotel room, and then 50% of those shall be long-term storage, so covered storage. Theaters, auditoriums, churches, um, takeout or sit down restaurants, bars, nightclubs, the YMCA, library, or a YMCA, I should say. One per thousand square feet of floor area. Um, so, just a question on yep. so you have a minimum of one space right. per category, but then you say at least 50% shall be long term. So, if you have one space, then what would it's gotta be? It has to be long term. Okay. I mean, that's what that, the interpretation mm -hmm. would be. I'm not sure if that's right. So, mm -hmm. yes, that's a good yeah. point. Okay. Which could be somebody, a garage. It could be, yeah, yeah. in somebody's Yeah, yeah garage. I just want to make sure we yeah. right. covered it with the 50%. Uh, you said the, the tenth of a, of a space would be rounded up or no? After, I mean, typically we round up at the normal rounding point, which is half or more, would be one. So a single-family house would not re have any requirement? It would have a minimum of one. That's why I added that because a single two, three, or four previous to that minimum of one would not be required to have any. So it does, in essence, get rounded up to one. Right. Anything below one gets rounded up to one after yeah. that. And it has to be covered. Right. 
Now you're talking about a single family, just one single family resident. All yeah. homes must have a bike storage place. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's what this would say. And also backing up that, any change, I mean, if somebody had a single family home and put a dormer on it, they'd have to add a covered parking place for a bike. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the single family home would seem to be mm -mm. problematic. Mm -mm. I mean, what if you build a house and you don't have a car, but you'd have to build a Just covered storage right. for your and bike. And don't have a garage. That's what I mean. That's what yeah. I mean. You'd have right. to build. And too old to ride a bike or uninterested in riding a bike or <clears throat> whatever else it might turn out to be. I don't, I'm not sure that I think outside okay. residential, that's fine. But, okay. but I, yeah. residential, that seems mm -hmm. heavy handed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you think it's just heavy handed for single family or do you think yeah. single two, three, and four, it should also be? Because so do you see what I'm saying? So until you get to point five space, it doesn't trigger any. How would three work? If you if you were building three houses on a piece of property and you demand one bicycle rack, then that means one of those houses has to have a covered place and the other two don't? Is that how that would be? Hmm. And I promise this is not meant to be as flippant as it's gonna sound. What's the purpose of this? I mean, what? why are we, why is this? What's the purpose for residential? Well, yeah, I mean, what, I mean. Well, um, because it, I th originally I think we were thinking of multifamily. So if you had, for instance, the two housing projects that uh, just got approved by the board, mm -hmm. there's 72 units in there and there's 55 units in the other one. We want, we do, we did require bike storage, but what's that number? Mm -hmm. So in the, you know, seven for the 72 unit one, it's 7.2 spaces, so it's going to be seven spaces. Three of them have to be covered. So the idea is, I mean, so that was, I think, the initial thinking behind the residential component. Um, we weren't necessarily thinking about single family because that's sort of a single or twos because people sort of create their own space. Exactly. Right. So. Okay, in the in the thing we were just looking at, they had a list of parking places and they had a list of covered parking places. Now, I don't know, but I suspect that those are not assigned to an individual person. That would be my guess with the co-housing area. If that were the case and, and you, you had what's in essence a semi-public, that is for the people that are there, and then you there has to be spaces for three bicycle racks. That almost seems more like for coming in. But for single family residents, it sounds like you're trying to encourage them to ride bicycles by having them have a space. I mean, it's, it's not like a restaurant or a YMCA where you're trying to encourage people to go to it on a bicycle. Um, I'm not so sure it works so well in the other direction. Okay. Well, but let me, uh, how many doorways have I walked my bicycle through every house has a is, if it's a single family house has a covered bicycle storage place already but I don't think we should have it in the okay um, no. this came up in transportation and parking and it was started uh, around the idea of how many does a school need mm -hmm. and we didn't have mm -hmm. any idea That's and right. I hope I, I have sent some things to Wayne he he was in that meeting so I was not realizing you were writing these so I sent him the yeah, you said oh, good. Okay, so I, I looked up New York and Portland, which are notorious mm -hmm. bicycle communities that have statutes for, mm -hmm. for planning. Um, Cambridge had one too, and it was close. It's the only one I found that was close to our size, and it obviously isn't our size. Mm. Um, DC had a manual for how to calculate bicycle demand, mm -hmm. and that was through the livable cities. What, what are we, is that what the the organization that gives us the seal? Oh, um, where's your, yeah. yeah, where's your email? Yeah. <laughs> you mean the, the star communities? No, bicycle yeah. friendly. Oh, bicycle friendly, okay. Uh, sent me the DC manual. So they actually had a 
book about how to come up with the number. Mm -hmm. And so I'm happy we're doing it. And I'm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure we don't have it all worked out for residential, but I, I never worried about the residential piece of it unless it was a, 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 a rental property where the, you know, the person needed to consider it for their renters. So then maybe you guys are okay with anything less than four or five units not having any? Or not having a mandated number. I, I am. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think if you get into a development okay. where there's half a dozen, yeah, it, you know, yeah. duplexes and triplex, okay. then yes. Mm -hmm. But if it's, if you have one duplex, they'll probably have it by default. But if they don't, I don't think we should make them have it. Okay. I agree. Yeah. Right. How do you do it even with a larger development like your 72 units that, where they had to have, what was, seven mm -hmm. park, uh, bicycle storage? Yeah. Where, where would they be? Well, that's part of the site plan. I mean, they have to figure it out on the site. So they figured it out. We already had, I mean, because site plan says you have to accommodate bicycles, and I think there's a bicycle storage language in there. I think it may be crossed out here as it, because this is a substitute. But it was sort of, at that point, it's, you know, they come in for tech review, and you said, you have to show us where your bike storage is. We don't know how many you should provide, but think about it and show us. And so they already, it's part, it was already part of the analysis under site plan. So could they just show seven par porches arbitrarily and say they're covered and people can put their bikes on them? And then um, build anything or provide? Potentially, mm -hmm. they could say, I mean, the porches is, I would say they are building the porch and they, if they can show that a bicycle can fit there because we have the standards for how big it has to be. Then they could say, you know, our um, our rental agreements are going to allow people to put bicycles on their porches. What about inside? Like yeah, anywhere. It could be wherever they want. In, in, right. you know, in the hallway, like yeah. The, the last time I remember it really being an issue was the new hotel, and we wanted covered mm -hmm. bike parking yeah. out front. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. we got our covered bike parking, but it was in back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, mostly when we talk to applicants and we say you need to meet this, you know, they're gonna, the board's going to want to see storage because you have to meet site plan approval criteria. Like Valley and like HAP, they just designed it into their site. Right. And it wasn't an issue. It just happened right. that at the hotel they didn't feel like they needed to do that, so they were asking the board not to have to do that. Okay. Okay, so we took that off. So point one space per dwelling unit, um, and then for okay, so wise um, libraries and so forth, one per thousand square feet. So just to go back, we were saying that there was a certain number, right, four or five. I mean, if you just if you do the rounding, you know, if it's greater than point five, so greater than five units, it would automatically right. round up to one. Right normally if you just leave it at right. that mm -hmm. right so we just right okay everybody good with that yes mm -hmm. did you find a reference for thousand square feet anywhere or is that just yours um it's been a while since we went through these numbers i don't recall i think we i don't remember where it was initiated okay. but we played with it and said does this make sense so I'm okay you know, with it. it the the why is 50,000 yeah. square feet many. or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about spaces. how many bike racks there are in front of Forbes Library compared to how many square feet, and it would be yeah. there are many more. But yeah. That's just, yeah. That's fine. Um, and then parking and transportation for the next one bumped up from half a space to one space per thousand square feet for commercial retail, seasonal retail, personal service. If, if those get bumped up to one, Per thousand, just like the the row above it, then do we need need two separate rows, or should those all oh. be lumped together? Oh, well, that's a good point. <laughs> Probably not. Just for yeah. Okay. So let me just make a note here. So how big is the Y in terms of square footage? Maybe I'm guessing four thousand, five thousand. The Y. Yeah. Oh no, it's bigger. It's bigger than that. Yeah. Twenty. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's big though. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it's great for us to just get something on the books is really my attitude here. We may learn a lot about it and change it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
but I just I was surprised there weren't a lot of examples out there. Right. I mean, as Carolyn said, up until now, we've just said, okay, think, please think about it and get back to us. Mm -hmm. So the manufacturing industrial is 0 0.1 um, per thousand square feet. Schools, colleges, um, private schools, or teaching areas, five spaces per classroom. Okay, I have a comment here. So I think of K through 12 uh, in college as needing a, uh, having more of a demand for bike parking than a business, trader, industrial school. Because I, I think of like a business or a trade school, the, the, the people, uh, the students are coming probably in a car or they're commuting from work to school to, whereas a K through 12, in a college, your round trip is, is basically to that school and home. And, you know, working on a campus, I know there's never enough bike parking to satisfy college students. So would there be opportunity to break those two out uh, and require more or require less from the business trade and industrial schools? Is classroom the way to go in terms of college? Is that the, is, is classroom, mm -hmm. I mean, K to 12 classroom seems pretty obvious, but I'm wondering about college where it's residential after all. But, but I, I, would, I would say, yeah, class, okay. class would be the way to go because they're still commuting from their dorm to a class. Okay. I mean, it seems like you could leave at five spaces per classroom and then take those other I agree with you and, and take those other like the trade school industrial school just take it out of that and I make it its own line make it's own category yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> what about an elementary school where kids are, are for, for yeah for I mean younger kids who aren't going to be riding their bikes mm -hmm. then it's just staff mm -hmm. you have five mm -hmm. parking five bike I think so elementary third and fourth are. graders ride their bike yeah mm -hmm. There's yeah. even money First for safe days. routes to schools yeah, where you develop the paths in the... Does so, so that include daycare? How does this fit in? Not K-12. Yeah. Oh, right. Two? So, yeah. yeah. Two per classroom? Two. Mm -hmm. Good catch. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, Temporary uses, none. Um, any permanent, okay, that's pretty easy. Closest use is determined by the building commissioner. <laughs> it's not difficult. Um, so then this is a new line. So office, our Office of Planning and Sustainability can authorize reduction in parking requirements when there are unique reasons why new bicycle parking is not required. So that's a staff level review. Mm -hmm. Um, C, all short-term parking shall incorporate bicycle racks and the following additional specifications. C, also Northampton Bicycle Parking Guide for graphics and precedence. So bicycle racks, so this gets into the detail of the site, the siting and the size and area around them. Bicycle racks shall be located within 50 feet of a primary building entrance. If the primary building entrance is within 50 feet of a public right-of-way, the bicycle rack should also be located adjacent to the public streets or sidewalks or with city approval within the right of way. Bicycle rack shall allow at least two and a half feet clear horizontal distance from the center point of the bike rack in direction in a direction perpendicular to the length of the bike and at least three feet clear horizontal distance from the center point of the bicycle rack in each direction parallel to the length of the bicycle to provide adequate space to store and remove a standard bicycle. Where did that language specifically come from? That came from somewhere else. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, any it, yeah, surprised. usually the manufacturers of the bike racks, they have yeah. the design that's a, that's specifications. Um, did we follow a manufacturer's recommendation or did that just come up from? Um, I have to say, I, for some of these, I don't know precisely where they came from, um, but we did pull from standard specs for some of these things. Mm -hmm. And 
of course, making sure, wanting to make sure that they're spaced adequately and um, people can get in and out. Well, my question was going too far. Spaced adequately, yes, but you don't want to end up needing a 20 foot long bike rack for four bikes because it's so onerous that you need five feet clear on each side, you know, or something crazy. Yeah. But I don't know how, if these are manufacturer standards or, you know, where these came from. Um, I get the intent and I agree with the okay. intent as long as yeah. it's reasonable. Well, well I can check on that and certainly have it for ordinance um, committee. I mean, you, you want it clear enough so you don't have to move other bikes aside to get right. your bike, but you don't want it to be the width of this desk for one bike, you know, and have between you, me, and Devin only three bikes stored on something this long. That doesn't uh, that doesn't make sense. Two either. and a half feet though implies that you get two bikes in that slot. I think. Yeah, I'm just wondering, and that might be fine. I'm just wondering where this came from. Or should we ref? Is there a way to reference uh, following manufacturers? Right, right. industry yeah, standard. Industry. And that way we're not getting into. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, this, this is so design. specific that uh -huh. it's um, that I think um, it might be helpful for people who don't really know. I mean, then we're not sending someone else to another manual to say, is this the right mm -hmm. one to look at? Also, um, there might be six different manuals. Mm. Right. Um, the idea, I mean, obviously, is so you can get in and out. I think, I'm just trying to think of how the U locks, I didn't measure the, you know, how we've got the standard U's out front um, and what the spacing is between those. Did you, this come up at parking and transportation at all? Not at that level. Yeah. I just wondered if there was a concern about the size. Um, I'll have to check on that and mm -hmm. you know you guys can certainly send if you wanted to send a comment up to ordinance committee to to Just say make you know, it like, so it's sure reasonable this. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay um, bicycle racks should be arranged either in rows or in alignment um, where bicycle racks are arranged in rows they shall um, be spaced at least two and a half feet apart on center so that's sort of reiterating so if you've got loops they're going to be two yeah. and a half feet apart but you can sh obviously share that space yeah it's two yeah. two right many. right um uh where bicycle racks are arranged in alignment they shall be spaced at least eight feet on center um when a bicycle rack is placed perpendicular to a curb, it must be located on the sidewalk with at least four feet from the curb to the nearest vertical component of the bike rack. And units placed parallel to the curb must be placed on the sidewalk with at least two feet from the curb to the bike rack. Uh, bicycles should be at least, uh, rack should be eight feet from a curbside or, or wall fire hydrant. Um, where 20 or more bicycle parking spaces are required, at least 5% of the required spaces must provide an additional two feet of space parallel to the length of the bicycle to accommodate tandem bicycles or bicycles with trailers. Bike rack shall include surfacing that is designed and maintained to be mud and dust free. The use of rock or gravel areas is permitted provided the, ed the edging materials such as landscape timbers are used so that the bicycle parking space is clearly demarcated and the rock material is contained. Uh, with the exception of residential use, uses, bicycle racks must be sufficiently separated from motor vehicle parking areas to protect parked bicycles. Separation must may be accomplished through grade separation, distance, or physical barriers such as curbs, wheel stops, poles, vegetation, or similar features. And with the exception of single and two-family uses, bike racks must be accessible by way of at least one clear, lighted, ADA accessible, stabilized surface, five foot wide, access route from bicycle parking to a public right-of-way that does not require carrying the bicycle and is free of any obstructions. Is the five foot ADA, is that where that comes from? Bicycle racks that require a user-supplied locking device shall be designed oh, to a, I'm I'm sorry. skip one. No. Um, I was waiting for a verbal response to that, so I wasn't paying attention. Um, back to nine, the, with the exception of single and two family uses, should that 
based on our comments earlier, should that be amended to, with the exception of anything under four or five houses? Um. So you're saying if you had a. He's to saying if you have to have a if you right. have to have one under residential circumstances, it has to have the following. Yeah, I don't know if it's right. So I'm not sure if even this is applicable. Maybe it should be. Yeah. Well, except for multifamily, you'd still want mm -hmm. it. So I don't think that because you're not going to hit a threshold with three and fours. Right. I don't think okay. it matters. So it probably doesn't matter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bicycle racks that require a user-supplied locking device shall be designed to accommodate both chain and U-shaped locking devices and shall support the bicycle frame at two locations, not just the wheel. Bicycle racks may provide bicycle parking spaces on each side, provided that both sides meet the spacing requirements set forth herein. If a rack meets the spacing requirements on one side of the stand but not the other, as may be the case where a bicycle rack is attached to a wall, then it may provide bicycle parking spaces on that side only. The preferred design for bike racks are post and loop and inverted U, and parking and transportation ditch the wave. <laughs> um, other designs may be approved by the planning board or Office of Planning and Sustainability to allow new or innovative technologies that provide equal or greater convenience and accessibility to bicyclists when compared to facilities designed according to the Northampton Bicycle Parking Guide standards. So, the, so that's when they had racks. the competition in East Hampton, and they've got bike racks that are, you know, shaped in mm. uh, guitars or things like that, yeah. that would be fall into this. Yeah. Okay. Um. So that's the bicycle storage. The rest is sidewalk. It's a lot here just to park your bike. <laughs> But, I mean, basically it sounds like we need to start somewhere and try to mm -hmm. bring everything together and have some sort of standard, and other than the residential issues, I, everything, I'm good that, with everything. I, yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's a great start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you need a recommendation to... Well, there's this other section, too. <laughs> for We're going to do them both at the same time? Okay. Yeah, because it's all within the same ordinance. Okay, okay. Carolyn, if, if it's more than 20 bikes, I want a bike maintenance station. <laughs> <laughs> you might be able to get that in site plan. <laughs> um, so adding to the section um, F that's in the site plan standards already, um, this is um, for the approval criteria under site plans, um, more detailed standards about this basically takes the standards that are already in the highway business design standards for sidewalks and puts them, uh, applies them to all projects that require site plan. So most of this language was already in the zoning ordinance but was only relevant to the HB district. Um, so all projects shall include sidewalks and tree belts abutting the street except where site topography and other limitations makes it infeasible. In such cases where sidewalks is a sidewalk is infeasible, the developer shall install an equal number of feet of sidewalk and or tree belt in another area of the community as deemed by the Planning Board or Office of Planning and Sustainability. All sidewalks should meet the following standards. Question. So we've seen developments where you have a cul-de-sac and it calls for sidewalks on both sides. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't make a lot of sense to have sidewalk on the inside loop because drainage is going that way and so forth. So the way this reads is if we don't have a sidewalk there, they have to take the lineal footage called for and put it somewhere else in the city? Except not under that scenario because that's under subdivision regs. Okay. So that wouldn't apply. This would only okay. apply if you're coming for site plan. Okay. So yes, though, if, um, um, you know, we've had this come up in the industrial park Mm -hmm. on occasion they come for the site plan and we require sidewalks along your frontage and some applicants over the years have said well the sidewalk is on the opposite side of the street and so we've asked the applicants to con continue the sidewalk that might not be in front of their property but mm -hmm. to continue the one that was started okay. so that is mm -hmm. comparable to what this language okay. is saying um, 
all internal and external sidewalks will be um, constructed of cement concrete. Sidewalks will be at least six feet in width in commercial zoning districts and industrial districts, and in all residential districts shall be at least five feet in width. If gratings are located in walking surfaces, um, then they shall have spaces no greater than half inch wide in one direction. If gratings have elongated openings, then they shall be placed so that the long dimension is perpendicular to the dominant direction of travel. Ramp. We, excuse me, we don't have any wording that says that already. It would seem that DPW regs wouldn't allow you to put wide grates or grates that run with traffic. Um, they have typical sidewalk construction standards. Um, I don't know if that's included in it. And um, I think we, because, but they don't have width standards. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think we thought it was appropriate to pull that into the site plan section. And these width standards are just, are specifically governed for uh, bicycle traffic. Well, no, this is pedestrian. Or ped okay. So it's the, so this is site plan relative to sidewalks only. Okay. Okay. Um, ramps allowing access to the sidewalk and street by various able persons shall be required at the corner or within the curb area immediately adjacent to the sidewalk. For any new driveway, the portion of the driveway that crosses the sidewalk shall conform to the sidewalk requirement set forth, regardless of whether there's a sidewalk improvement extending along the balance of the frontage, with sidewalks constructed with extra depth to withstand cars. Um, and then cross slopes should be 1 to 50 and maintained across the entire driveway. Um, curb extensions may be used at any corner location or any mid-block location where there's a marked crosswalk provided there's parking lane into which the curb may be extended. It may include transit stops. Curb extensions must be designed so as not to impede bicycle traffic. Curbs must be extended into one or both streets at a corner, and no obstructions to private use should occur in the curb extension. Okay. <laughs> Exhale. Uh, any discussion, comments on this? I don't think we've had a discussion on it as we went along. So we need a recommendation for these two to move forward. Yeah. Recommendation is city council. Yep. Um, for adoption. Okay, I'll try and do this. Mm -hmm. Move and recommend the city council zoning or amendment 350-2, 350-8.11 and 350-11.6, defining and specifying bicycle parking and pedestrian access standards. As I want the amendments. Yeah. Oh, as amended, as amended uh, tonight. Second. Second by Devin. Any discussion? All in favor? All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Next up, LED sign ordinance. So this is not yet an ordinance that's been. This is anything to do with council. Christmas lights or anything. Mm -hmm. um, so this um, ordinance, um, I was asked to draft an ordinance to address LED signs um, back in December by a, a couple of city councilors um, who had a constituent call to complain about the new high school sign that went up mm -hmm. and a concern about the proliferation of these signs throughout just uh, is the would the sign at the VA fall into this category? No, we have no control mm -hmm. over the federal oh. government because it lights up but the entire the same, yeah, yeah. sky <laughs> but that also but it's that type of sign is it's that, that yeah. type of okay, sign so, yes, okay. that was my so that's sort of the thing we don't want you guys already um, initiated an ordinance for billboards mm -hmm. and LED signs for billboards. Right. So that's covered. This is for um, on-premise display signs. And given the fact that, you know, there are a lot of changeable, hand-changeable copy signs out there and with LED technology changing, I think it's 
Oh, and you've se we've seen it already with the gas stations coming forward mm -hmm. um, with their price signing, um, wanting to change. We don't have anything specifically that says you, I mean, we allow indirect or direct light lit sign, and we've just interpreted LED signs to fall within that category. So, so far all the signs that you've seen that have gone up have um, been approved because we don't have anything that says you can't do an LED sign and, and they're more energy efficient <coughs> than that. Um, so, so the issue here is creating a sign ordinance that restricts, um, that specifies the brightness of the LED um, <coughs> signs. I've also heard complaints about the Academy sign yep. that it's just really um, too bright. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it, res it would restrict um, um, the time um, that the signs are allowed to be on how much space is allocated for the LED component in certain cases. And then, um, so the curfew, the size of signage, and the type of businesses that would be allowed to have the signs. Um, it started out, so there was, there was no, so the initial interest by the constituent was, we need to ban all of these. We don't want any LED signs anywhere. City Councilor said, well, that doesn't really make sense because there are business signs that are lit now and maybe it's better, more energy efficient to have these LED signs and it makes it easier to change and all of that. So let's not go all the way to that end, but let's start some, somewhere else. But um, in particular, um, so the two councilors that are going to sponsor this are Councilor Adams and Councilor Murphy. Councilor <coughs> Murphy asked that you all look at this and give feedback on the concept before it goes anywhere. So that's why this is in front of you as sort of yeah. an other item. I guess I go back to where you started this is some ways that we're creating a very specific ordinance for a very specific type of sign. But we already have lots of sign ordinances. I guess I'm trying to, I mean, I understand there could be pluses and minuses both ways, but why doesn't it just fall under the sign ordinances we have now? Well, because we don't have any, because the nature, well, uh, two things. This would also address signs that may stay on all night long and businesses are closed. So this, um, so, and as, tra and as signs transition from one technology to another, that would then come with a component potentially if it if you all agree and city council agrees and it gets adopted that there's a curfew on sign lighting um, so that's something new that we don't have we also uh, the led technology is so different from the existing internally illuminated signs that we have um, you know as i was doing this research there's a ton of research about the the safety component right. of signs right on the roadway and, and the, the flashing nature and the motion, right. even if it's not quick flashing, if you have, you know, web addresses and phone numbers, you got people driving trying to, you know, get their stuff on the phone. And so we don't think we can regulate exactly what you can put on signs because you're not ever allowed to regulate the content. There's some cities around the country who have said you can't have web addresses or phone numbers, and we don't think we can do that because that's content. Mm -hmm. But if there are other ways we can address the sign thing. Could you so say that they must be stationary? Yes. Um, so the other piece of it is, um, so the way w the, these are sort of referred to generally um, as dynamic display signs, meaning they can take all sorts of forms. Um, and so I wanted to define that in the sign section, but also um, create a standard um, when those signs can be changed, when the text can be changed, how often, and what they can, um, essentially, what they can show, text versus images. Um, so the first piece is just defining what these LED signs are, dynamic display signs. Um, and then adding a new section that would um, potentially say, a dynamic display sign on or in a 
mobile vehicle parked in public view is not allowed, even if it's registered, because we don't have that now. Mm -hmm. um, typically, in the last building commissioner more so is said that if anything was a registered vehicle, we wouldn't touch it with zoning, even if there were signs all over the place. So this sort of says, you know, there are some appropriate thing places for these, um, and we should treat them like signs. And um, and then also this says. Um, institutional and residential uses in residential districts are um, that, that we would change the allowances for these types of signs in residential districts because we have churches and um, nursing faci care facilities um, that are in residential districts and schools mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's going to have a different impact on the neighbor surrounding neighborhood than in a commercial district so we wanted to um, clearly distinguish that so uh, what's proposed here is to you know define the dynamic display and say that you know there's certain uses where these are not allowed so membership clubs funeral establishments can't have dynamic display signs you know they'll have to have maybe they can change to LED technology but it'll have to be internally illuminated on a sign case um, but not changeable text um, but churches and schools may have dynamic displays um, but very specific standards so um, the display the, t the dynamic display can only be half of the total sign so if you think of the Northampton High sign if you've seen it there's a you know flat panel that just says Northampton High School and then there's the text digital display mm -hmm. so that um, the digital display isn't the entire sign um, so would that be, I mean, uh, prohibited what the sign in front of high school? Um, not the way this is written, except that um, the next bullet is minimum display time between display changes shall be 30 minutes. And the transition time to make that change has to be sort of instantaneous. Right now they're flashing all sorts of superfluous messages every, you know, very frequently. Um, that you know has an impact on the neighborhood when you have this constantly changing text right. um, and I'm not so sure schools really need to advertise that there's a school break and then by the way there's exams next week you know every two seconds right <laughs> um, so um, that sort of would address that um, and that the display boards can't emit sound um, and that if there are images displayed, they can only be static, they can't change. Um, and that they must be turned off at the close of function hours or business hours. And also there's a, that there's a dimming component so that when the ambient light um, is darker that the LED, the LED lights um, dim as well. So that's the residential piece, and then also restrictions saying that, you know, in certain residential districts, again, no dynamic display signs would be allowed for bed and breakfasts um, or other sort of the special uses that are in residential districts. And then for the, um, and also we allow signs for residential subdivisions, you know, entryway signs. Mm -hmm. So thinking about that, prohibiting dynamic displays for those. Um, and then for the commercial side, um, that dynamic displays would only be allowed in for gas stations, theaters, or public event venues. So, um, how do you pick those? Yeah. Well, because gas stations are the cat out of the bag. Well, no, oh, not that, but their price changes happen frequently and it's just you know I can't imagine in 50 years making someone get up there and <laughs> change the letters out I think it's just a function of what type of use it is and it makes sense that they have an easy way to do that um, but that they can't display all the other things for sale at the convenience store um, so somebody like I think North Shore seafood has a display in the window, I think. Yes. That they mm -hmm. that they change, so that wouldn't be allowed in something like this. Well. Or or. So that doesn't actually. 
um, I need to check if I address that. So that's we have this. In the window, right? It's in we the have right. an exemption for windows, so you can have a wall sign, and you can have a side wall sign, a front wall sign, potentially a rear wall sign, and potentially a ground sign. And we don't. We say if it's in the glass, we you can have almost whatever you want as long as it doesn't take up 20% of the window area. So, so you could I have a like dynamic would, sign, LED sign with animation and graphics and fish for and all this but if you just plop it in the window it's okay but if well, you put it outside in the grass it's not okay uh, um that's a good question maybe we need to add that yeah. <laughs> um we've always up till this point we've always said flashing signs are not allowed but we've left it up to the police chief to say is this a distraction so the police chief has come up with this ad hoc number that if it changes every 10 seconds then it wouldn't be considered a traffic safety risk. I'm not sure that that one in particular, I don't know, I haven't looked at it in a while. But well, what was the zoning on the, we were talking about it six months ago on the um, two doors down from faces and it had the in the windows. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, what was that? So that was the same thing. There was this, um, that was because it was a distraction. So the, so the changing, um, light was a s public safety issue. Right. So, but there's we some. We have something in that. place in for that already. Right, but it's not. There's not a written standard, okay. and so it was a coordination between the building commissioner and uh, mostly the building commissioner. Okay. Um, so let me make a note of that. Actually, window signs. So window signs. No, dynamic display. Well, I don't know if I. We're allowed, I don't know right? if I have an issue with North Shore saying, you know, haddock on sale or half pound for this, and then it sits there for thirty minutes, and then not, the next, then it rotates to another. So maybe it's you know, the swordfish. transition time. Yeah. yeah. So the way that these the, in the commercial districts, the way I pitched it is minimum display time is two minutes. So you can't transition left, you know, into the next thing. I mean, I could foresee. Or actually, that's not, uh, yeah. Restaurants, you know, putting their menu up. Right. Or, you know, pizza shops having whatever, sale, you know, whatever, and just plopping it in the window. Yeah. But I don't know if that's a bad thing or we should not allow that. Well, but, I mean, you said that the police chief, I mean. Well, right now he's using a 10-second rule. That if it's more, I mean. If it's less, less than, than that, then it, then it has potential to be a distraction. Right. That, that sounds too I mean, I'm thinking about traffic, and so you want you want a car to be able to go by without being demanded to look away from the traffic. So that seems a little, a little short to me. But well, that's why I came up with the two minutes for commercial districts. Okay. That's what some other jurisdictions around the country are using um, that don't want sort of this constant. I mean, if you put an LED sign in every storefront on Main Street on both sides, and every two minutes, and they're staggered, so. You, you know, you can't go 100 feet without just being bombarded with. So I don't know how you, you'd regulate <coughs> that or if we don't allow that or, or just extend well, the. You know, Times Square. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And people, it's, it's fun. Yeah, people survive. Mm. There's not that many accidents yeah. in time. You know, I don't know. I feel like this is getting extreme. Yeah, I'm wondering if, uh, first of all, I'm handicapped in particular because I, from this angle, I can't read any of that. Um, okay. So Are I'm trying to listen to <laughs> Yeah, I probably should have, yeah. Um, and I'm won wondering if it's all too intrusive and detailed and restrictive. I, I would like to have an opportunity to read it over more carefully and think about it and look around town. I mean, I know the, the one thing that you mentioned, the, the sign in front of the high school I drive by often, and I've never been struck, I thought that it was anything but the most benign, yeah. benign sign. Um, I can't imagine being interested in prohibiting that modest little sign there. I, I think the issue is you may feel like, well, uh, obviously people may disagree with you, but... Right. You may think that's modest, but there's nothing in the rules that say that's the limit. Right. So it could be something entirely different because we don't have a standard 
for the size or you know how it functions and so I think the concern is it could be the Academy sign it could be the right, Academy right. sign it could Which be everybody um, universally hates right. how do we get it I don't know. Yeah. Wait, because we don't have a standard. Not totally universal. I think it's great. No. <laughs> you know, whatever. That's just me, my personal opinion. But I, I think we ought to go very slowly on this. It seems very intrusive and restrictive. I, I don't have an issue with conceptually having a sign that that dims as it gets darker or turns off when business is closed. Or provides information that kind of hangs there for a certain period of time I don't think I think there should be some structure so we don't end up with Times Square down at the, the no. main intersection of downtown but if if every storefront had an LED sign that hung there for 10 minutes or whatever that whatever that threshold is and then rotated you know from the appetizer menu to the main course menu or whatever it might be I don't think that's necessarily problematic so I don't think we should then I think we're getting too intrusive but to say if you're going to have a sign, it needs to turn off or it needs to dim or you can't be flipping every 20 seconds, I think that's okay. Yeah, I'm not saying there shouldn't be any regulation, but I personally don't have any idea. I couldn't vote on this myself at all. Um, because you don't feel comfortable with it. Because I can't read it, <laughs> um, number one. <laughs> and number two, I think it's we ought to move carefully and slowly on it and digest look around town with these ideas in mind and s try them out uh, is this something people want to think about more well, I mean and we didn't yeah, get it yeah I mean you're just introducing it right I mean we're not right I'm not asking you to vote I, I'm asking you more sort of to f get your feedback mm -hmm. this hasn't been formally introduced at all it's sort of the first cut this is the first viewing of any text that has yeah. been put out there based on the request that came to me to work on this okay. and um, and frankly you know city council said you know I'd like to hear what the planning board has to say about something like this so the only if there's no there's nothing pushing you to say you have to make a decision tonight um, you can read through you know what I sent and did you send this to us maybe I'm not mm -hmm. getting my email yeah it was an attachment does the LED light have levels of intensities? Yes. Mm. That um, would make an awful difference. Yeah, it's, um, and I, you know, when I looked, there are some communities that regulate it, um, and there's a different standards, um, there are different standards used for LED lights than there are that we, when we use for sight lights, because you're looking at what's coming from the sign mm -hmm. as opposed to what's mm -hmm. what you know, sign shining is. down right, right. onto the site. Mm -hmm. um, so Louie and I had a conversation about whether we should include this new standard and the typical standard is based on NITS, mm -hmm. um, which is, <laughs> which has a, ca you know, you can figure out the foot candles, you know, based on that. Um, he felt like they're, Probably we could start with just having the the current lighting standards apply. So we can't have more than a maximum of, you know, three to five foot candles from any one site. And that maybe the better thing to start out was keep it that way. Don't introduce a new, you know, light standard. Um, but have make sure that it does dim at night. That there's that differential um, and a cell sensor most of the technology has I mean that's standard but I'm not sure that it's here at the Academy um, or that they have it turned on or whatever it doesn't seem like it dims right. um, at all it all yeah um, so making sure that that gets to be incorporated into the, that piece of it but you know there are a lot of things you know that um, you know looking at what some of the other communities have done and what the sign technology is out there it's a little bit daunting because it's changing so quickly there are these moving video images that go on roving mm -hmm. trucks and you know that's a clear <laughs> safety hazard I think but also on on signs and I mean like the VA has that right. yeah. so well then for one right is there oh. is there a night sky component to this because the one at the VA is bright enough oh, that God. it is mm -hmm. it, it needs to be shielded mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't see that in this anywhere 
Right, so the idea was if it meets, that we didn't put a shielding component, you know, if there's a cap at the top, a lot of these boxes don't have, you know, they're just sort of flush. Right. Um, I didn't frankly think about that because we have the light standard and if we're putting a curfew on this, so to speak, then it's not going to be, okay. you know, for the most part they'll be turned off. It as the, as it gets darker, the light's supposed to dim with okay. the darkness. And, and if, if the curfew is instituted, then we're assured that it right. won't be for for businesses that close that it won't be on all night. I mean, I I think I'm okay initially with no dynamic signs. It needs to dim as it gets darker. It needs to turn off when business is closed. But I I think it warrants more review, more discussion before we jump in with a okay. recommendation or not. If we if we established a standard. Couldn't we nicely write a letter to the VA and tell them what our standard is and suggest maybe it would be nice if their light was less intrusive? I mean, is that not something we could do once we had established sure. our own standard? Sure. Well, well, I that like that's a me pretty new should. sign, so I think it would have the capability to dim at night. Yeah. Again, maybe I need new glasses, but I live in Leeds, drive by the VA every day, and the sign never struck me as inappropriate or obtrusive or too bright. Not never once. I guess I need better glasses. <laughs> you well, like I, I mean, I'm the same. I live right up the street uh, from them, but at night, I, I mean, it, it's really bright. Yeah. And then they have another one that just like a hundred yards up their road. They have a, they have another one actually that, that uh, is uh, interior interiorly. That, yeah, where yeah. the where it goes up and starts. It, there's another one right there that has. You, know, you can't of, see that from the road though. Uh -huh. Yeah. If you yeah. I was by last night. I think what is that up yeah, there? Yeah. Looking straight ahead. Yeah. I guess that's my problem. Well, and, and it seems. I mean, I, and I'm kind of like with Mark. I mean, I, I think yes, as technology is going to keep changing, putting some basic parameters around, and I think. Maybe in some ways, almost thinking of them more as lights, as opposed to signs. Maybe right, that maybe right. that's why. Maybe that's how because that's the issue. You know, mm -hmm. are they safe? Are they? Uh, and you know, the chief is you know has got you know that's probably not a bad rule of thumb. If it's not changing more than every ten seconds, then okay, it's at least not creating a distraction. Kind of, you know, depending on what's on it. But yeah, yeah, maybe that's the you know, it's almost thinking of it as a light as opposed to a sign. Right? Like, and public safety and. And the light yeah, should be uh, the two big things. Right. I think that's what I mean. I think that's what people have with the what I've heard people say about like the one at the academy is just so it's so bright, it's distracting. I mean, right. It's not down a very busy intersection, right. and all of a sudden there's just this big light. Yeah. Uh, I've heard it's not the information or the size of the font or whatever. It's no, just it's, it's just so bright. Right. Yeah. And you're, you know, it's a very busy area and everything. I think that's the thing. You know, that, that people, at least the, the, you know, I've heard people say. About. Did they have to get central business architecture approval? Well, yeah. That's, true. Yeah, that's, that's the piece that bothers me yeah. about it. It's not that it, it just appeared and everyone and ever was. Oh, where did that come from? I think the other the other piece about so that, I hear that that sounds like good guidance. Um, I think the other piece is also in the the residential piece. It's not just safety, but it's impact to. Um, neighbors, yeah. neighborhoods, yeah. or the institutional uses that are sort of buried deep in neighborhoods. Right. Yeah. Which um, goes back to the light pollution. Right, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 If you can see a flashing or something, you can't really see it, it's there, and you're almost coming in your window or something. Okay. Okay. So, so we. So, do you want to, do you want, um, do you want to take some more time to review this and we'll put it on another agenda? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I won't mess with any language and Help just, yourself. just <laughs> I mean, if you heard anything okay. that you yeah. think would improve it, I yeah yeah, okay. and then um, we'll look yeah. at this because next I didn't month go look at the lighting. I mean, that's you know yeah. to, mm -hmm. to what John is talking yeah. about. I didn't think about what else could dovetail yeah. with it. Yeah. Okay. Could you send it to me again, please? Maybe I've gotten it, but I didn't. Sure. So, I just sure. send it to you. Do you, oh, have, do you have email on your phone? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is way far. <coughs> you are, you're not on the original, unless you're email. Uh, we have one last item to review the minutes of January 8th. I move we approve the minutes of January 8th. Second. 
No corrections, Devin? I gave them yeah, to her. a couple of capital oh. letters. Too much on, on my oh, phone to get to my email. No. Oh, okay. I, I slipped you another. Oh, it's this one here. This one. No, it's here. Oh. As amended and, by Devin? Yeah. Oh, wait, let me just get out of here so I can. Yeah, there were some capital letters that were. Street was one or something. I don't know. There were a couple of them. But. Motion by Devin. Seconded that. John? Any discussion? All in favor? Oh, Alan abstains. No, he's been <laughs> <laughs> looking at my email. <laughs> uh, okay, I need one more motion. Oh wait, to adjourn. Oh, no, 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 hold on, no, no, hold on. Sorry. Got more? Um, yes, I have an A and R. Uh, be quick. That sounds rude. Yeah, do you feel it? <laughs> Is that too much information? <laughs> Oh. This is one of those, we need to approve something. Yeah, why, why are we talking about yeah. it? It's not right, exactly. So this is just essentially a land swap. A property owner owns two abutting parcels, and they want to carve off one piece in the back, not along the frontage, and shift it to the other piece so they have more. So there's no frontage change. They're keeping the same lot size. It's um, right up after you pass Florence Fields going up the hill on the west side um, and not creating any new lots just a little swap of land where is it spring street um, oh, okay. across mm -hmm. from florence fields up the mm -hmm. way a little bit if they're not changing lots Where's what's their purpose uh, um they a own a rental lot. property no, and they down. have their house oh, where they live and they want to allocate oh, more oh, land oh, from the rental oh, property to the house where yeah. they live yeah. okay I have an issue with that? No. Okay. So you need a motion on this? Um, yes, for you to allow it to be endorsed. I move we approve for the planning office to do an A and R on the on Spring Street. Second. Okay. Yeah. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Alan abstains. <laughs> <laughs> I'll vote for it, whatever it was. Uh, okay, that's approved now. Another motion. Adjourn.